¿Qué tal? Buenos días, bienvenidos a, estas cuarto, a este cuarto encuentro de la, de la lesión deportiva. Es para nosotros un honor poder volver a realizar esta, este evento para, para todos vosotros. Eh, cuarto año, como, como digo... Event we've organized for all of you, fourth edition, once again. Uh, the best professionals in the field have gathered here for the enjoyment of all of our students. I'd like to thank those of you who've come here, um, and also those of us, those of you who are streaming this event from home. I'd like to thank the Real Madrid University School and the European University for their collaboration and for their effort in uh, organizing uh, this event. So, here with us we have our Vice Dean, Jose Luis Alonso. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to um, welcome you all to this event. As Diego was saying, this is currently being streamed uh, live all over the world. Um, I'd like to congratulate the teaching staff and all the management at the European University and the Real Madrid University School. As uh, Sergio uh, said earlier, every year they make um, a great effort to organize events like this one for the benefit of all of our uh, students. It is a pleasure for us to be here. It's a pleasure to have today with us a number of incredible professionals in their respective fields. Um, after the COVID-19 pandemic, I believe that new uh, standards were, um, were set when it comes to events like this one. Uh, they have improved greatly, and I'm very, very happy to be here. Once again, congratulations, everyone, for everything you've done. Thank you very much. Okay, so without further ado, let's begin. Let's kick this off. We couldn't begin this in any other way than uh, offering a homage to Ángel Vasas, the director of the uh, Masters for a number of years, an international uh, reference in physical therapy and injury recovery. But I would also like to pay homage to Carlos, his son, a student here and someone who uh, last year took part in the last edition of this event representing uh, the students. He presented his end of year uh, dissertation and uh, once again Ángel had taken part in the 2020 and 21, 2021 editions, a professional, uh, an incredible professional, a reference uh, as a person as well. And so we'd like to offer our con um, sympathies to the family for what uh, unfortunately happened. Big round of applause. Very well. In our first round table, we'll be talking to Dr. Rodriguez Sanz, Sergio Vázquez, and Álvaro Guerrero. We'll be discussing physical therapy in the sport industry, in the world of sports. This is something that isn't always addressed in scientific journals and scientific articles, but yet it is something that you students should uh, become familiar with. How do physical therapists operate in the world of um, sports when they treat either individual athletes or uh, sport teams? Our first speaker is Professor Sergio Vázquez. This round table is sponsored by the Centro Médico Premium Madrid. It's a multidisciplinary center uh, whose staff is made up of pathologists, psychologists, nutritionists, physical therapists, and sports um, physicians.
Bueno, sin más, vamos a dar comienzo a esta primera mesa okay, de debate. Como decía, ya comienzo el profesor Sergio Vázquez. Sergio es fisioterapeuta y ha dedicado más de 20 años de su carrera profesional al mundo del deporte profesional. Ha dedicado más de 20 años de su carrera profesional al mundo del deporte profesional. Es director del Premium Center en Madrid. And also collaborates regularly with the uh, Real Madrid University uh, Diego, School. Over uh, to you, Sergio. Thank you very much, Diego. And thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you for being here, either in person uh, or um, at home, streaming this event. I hope you will enjoy this talk uh, and generally the whole event. Let me tell you, we organize events like this one uh, truly with lots of love. It's a great opportunity for people like me to be here in front of you to share our experiences and uh, whatever bit of knowledge we can contribute. As Diego was saying earlier, I would like to dedicate this intervention to Dr. Ángel Basas and his son Carlos with whom uh, we've truly shared a lot of beautiful moments, both personally and professionally. So I'd like to dedicate this to them. Okay, I'm here today to talk to you about how it is I work in the world of sports. This is not my presentation, though. This is Álvaro's <laughs> presentation. It's been a bit of a mistake. If uh, Diego um, allows me, I'd like to introduce Álvaro, his co-founder of the Centro Medico Premium Madrid. We've been working together for uh, about 20 years. Uh, and as professionals together, we've worked with athletes from a number of different sports. Uh, Alvaro has a lot of experience working with athletes, let's say within the locker room, but also outside of it. He's co-director of the Masters as well. Um, and I think, I'd just like to say that we've been able to do uh, all of this, organizing these events, working in a number of different uh, fields and different sports, precisely because at our center we have a multidisciplinary um, focus. Over to you, Alvaro. You can take the floor now if you like. Yes, well, after more than 20 years um, spent together working, we can easily share presentations, uh, co-present the same talk, so to speak. Uh, Sergio and I are here today to talk to you about how it is we operate in the world of sports. But first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all of our eh, attendees. Eh, uh, perhaps I'm getting old, but I'd like to say that, well, the three past editions of this event have been viewed by more than three million people all over the world. Um, but uh, they were held online, fully online, and this is the first in-person event we've held in a while, and I'm very grateful. Uh, thank you for coming here in person. Okay, so when I came to organizing this fourth edition of the event, Diego suggested I talk about this, uh, elite athletes and how they can be treated. And I told him, you know, Alvaro, this is something I can talk about from my day-to-day -day experience. There aren't any scientific papers, articles uh, about this. How is it that you, we uh, work with uh, elite athletes uh, as physical therapists? That's something that scientific articles couldn't possibly talk about because it's something that's based on our day-to-day -day experiences, and that's something I've been doing for the past eight years of my career. So. Let's dive in. Let's ask ourselves this. What is our goal when it comes to working with an elite athlete? Well, to me, the goal is very clear optimizing this, their performance. That's the only goal. And how do we achieve that? By doing something that Sergio loves. I like to tell my athletes that I'm their health manager. What does that mean? It means I'm the person who 
coordinate all the services this athlete needs to uh, optimize, maximize their performance. So who's a health manager? It's a person who spends a lot of time with an elite athlete. It doesn't have to be the physical therapist. It can be a physician. It can be the coach as well. And at this point, you may wonder, uh, but an athlete's coach is not a medical expert. That's true. But coaches are managers. Athletes are faced normally with a lot of pressure. They need to know when they need to go to see a doctor, a physical therapist, when they have to train. And that's a decision that should be made by one single person, a health manager. And that can be a coach as well. But it can also be a medical professional. So how do we go about it? We come up with a working plan for our athletes. These working plans are based on the five pillars you see on screen. We create a multidisciplinary team which on a weekly basis looks at uh, the athlete, what they need to achieve by the end of the week and plan out their week accordingly throughout the year. We customize our treatment as much as we can. What does that mean? That if something happens uh, throughout the week, for example, I don't know, the athlete gets a day off or the next game is postponed, uh, he has a little bit of an injury, we completely reschedule uh, all the appointments. We completely replan uh, the athlete's schedule. And once again, we do this individually, athlete by athlete. Our motto is our athletes need to receive what they need when they need it. It's not the same as saying what they want when they want it. We don't give our athletes what they want when they need it. We give our athletes what they need when they need it. Once again, the goal is to maximize performance. And as a result, there is something we ask our athletes in return. Commitment. It's not okay if an, an athlete says, this month um, we're not really competing, so I, I'd like to... Uh, well, not train as hard as I did, uh, that's not okay. We're the planners. Okay. Now, I believe you're familiar with um, this image. It's something we always show in our uh, physical therapy masters at the Real Madrid uh, University School. So you're familiar with it. This is this image is very important to us. People are basically dynamic, open, complex systems. This probably already rings a bell. I say this all the time. The way our body works is quite unpredictable. It's chaotic at the very least. And so there are eight pillars we should take into account. Structure. The musculoskeletal structure of an athlete needs to be able to withhold loads. Strength, post-competition or post-training recovery, skills, perception, that's something we should also look into. The environment where athletes operate, the social and uh, family related environment and their psychological condition. Only by looking at these eight pillars can we effectively improve an athlete's performance. Once again, we work with multidisciplinary teams. We have a medical physician, um, a nutritionist, a physical therapist, a cook, coaches, a psychologist, and a podologist. All of them specialized in sports. You may be wondering, why do you even have a cook? Well, we have a cook because this is all about maximizing performance, okay? We're not talking about people who more or less make a living out of the sport they practice. We're talking about elite athletes, world champions, people who compete in the top European leagues. If we want to maximize performance, then you have to be, to be very, very detail-oriented. And uh, I don't know about you, but 
There are lots of dishes recommended by nutritionists that I wouldn't be able to cook, and that's why we have cooks. And our cooks uh, basically do the meal prep for our athletes. Over the course of the year, we also occasionally, frequently actually work with dentists, uh, specialist physicians in a number of different fields, because athletes are people, just like us, and so uh, they can experience any number of uh, uh, setbacks throughout the year. We have physical therapists uh, specialized in a number of things. For example, if uh, I don't know, an athlete might might need a lymphatic drainage massage after a surgery. Uh, one of our athletes might get pregnant, uh, might give birth, and needs uh, specialized attention, for example, for her pelvic floor. So when these things happen, we have specialized physical therapists that come in and help us. And then we have a sports analyst. Sometimes we have sports analysts within our run-of-the-mill team. Sometimes we just hire them on occasion, on an ad hoc basis. Now, key situations. There are two of them. Whether the athlete is injured or not actually determines a number of things that we have to do. When an athlete is injured, there are five critical issues that you need to address. The first one is a precise, accurate uh, diag uh, diagnosis as soon as possible. It needs to be very, very um, early on. Because this is about the professional life of an athlete. There can't be any ambiguity in a diagnosis. It's not okay to have someone say, yes, okay, your athlete needs an MRI, we can do it in a, in a few days. No, a few days is not accurate enough. It needs to be done immediately, okay? Another thing you have to do when an athlete is injured is manage expectations, especially if the athlete is prone to anxiety and young, because they're going to want to get back to training as soon as possible. And it is actually very, very likely for the pain to disappear way before the tissue is completely healed. If the muscle is damaged, the pain at some point will go away, but it doesn't mean that the muscle is healthy. Uh, and so you have to manage expectations. You have to tell your athlete and they have to confirm that they've understood. And this requires a detailed explanation. The next two points are key. <coughs> Competition calendar analysis and risk management. It's not the same when an athlete gets injured pre-season as when they get injured right before the last league match. And it's not the same to get injured before the last league match if you've already won the league or if that match, for example, is decisive for, for the outcome of the league, okay? So depending on all of that, decisions need to be made. But you have to manage risks at the same time. How risky is a relapse? Is it the same to get back to training if you sprain your ankle as it would be to go back to training a little early if you've torn your ACL, for example? If you have a, an ankle sprain and the athlete really need, needs to play, you can do an infiltration. There's going to be a little inflammation, a little pain, but the consequences of playing on an ankle sprain aren't going to be too serious. But if you've torn, for example, a tendon in your quadriceps, then you need surgery. And it probably means the athlete will never get back to uh, top performance shape. And so different decisions need to be made in this case. Uh, and in this regard, we, as physical therapists, play a very important role. When an athlete is not injured, then we just do our work on a day-to-day -day basis. Our athletes need to feel that they're being taken care of, that they're not alone. Let's take into account that athletes are people. A lot of people in the, in the world of sports seem to forget this. They think that athletes are machines, but they're not. They're people. They're people like us. Um, and they have insecurities, uh, personal problems. They have feelings.
and daily they are absolutely bombarded by information picture how much you're bombarded with informa by information on social media and multiply it by a hundred that's what they're exposed to they get information from social media from from their teammates from their coach from their doctors and that's not easy to manage on a day-to-day -day basis that's not easy to handle and so we need to be familiar also with the people they're surrounded with we all have a different reality personal reality that we live in as people the same is true for athletes and we need to be familiar with that and then depending on the sport uh, we're talking about or the club the athlete plays for we also uh, tend to be present if we can when they train when they compete and uh, every day uh, we we provide them with the support they need now there are other occurrences that aren't exact, uh, exactly injuries uh, that you should still uh, take into account when planning out your season. Uh, little interventions, we like to call them. Things that can happen and things that have happened to our athletes in the season. Uh, the three cases I'd like to talk to you about happened to our athletes in the past few months. One day, uh, an athlete came to see me, he had a little uh, black dots uh, in the foot. I sent a picture of that to our pathologist. He had a little papilloma and uh, a game was... Uh, he had this athlete needed to play a game in two days, so we needed to, to decide whether we wanted to burn it off or not. We did do that. We burnt off the uh, papilloma on a Monday morning and on Wednesday the athlete was able to compete. Uh, he didn't miss one single day of training. So we solved the problem and the athlete didn't miss out on any training sessions or official matches. Similar thing, in September one of our athletes had a little bit of a bump, a lump uh, in his foot. Uh, and he came to us saying that, uh, look, this is not bothering me, but I went to the beach, uh, I got a little scratch uh, in my foot and I think a little sand got in it. Eventually this lump started bothering him, he had a match on a Sunday and then on Monday morning we opened up this lump took out the sand, there was in fact a little sand in it um, stitched it up, rested for 40 days, and then he was fine. But there was another case uh, where we had to remove four wisdom teeth uh, out of one of our athletes. But uh, because there were still five games left to play in the league, what we did was we prescribed antibiotics first, and once the season was over, we extracted the four wisdom uh, teeth. And so this is something we've been able to do precisely because we work as part of a multidisciplinary team. Now, to conclude, Sergio and I are getting a bit old, have some grey hair, um, and so we can tell you this. The most important thing you have to do is empower your athlete. Athletes are people like us, and as such, they have a right to make decisions informed decisions about their health. So what we do is we appraise, but they have the final say on everything. They make the decisions. Bear that in mind. We convene, we meet three times a year with our athletes to ask them for feedback. We ask them, are you comfortable with the work plan we've come up with for you? Because we may think that it's perfect, but maybe they're not comfortable with it for whatever reason. So three times a year we sit down with them, we review our work plan and uh, we go back to planning accordingly. And finally, we are not their friends. Bear that in mind. We are a multidisciplinary team which works with a view to optimizing their performance. Sometimes I see pictures on social media and it is true that we spend a lot of time with them, maybe more than they spend with their own family and sometimes we tend to believe that we're their friends. But that has two consequences. One, the athlete 
It doesn't take you seriously anymore. So you lose professional credibility. And two, you're not quite as attentive to what is going on. Whereas if you do keep a little distance, a little professional distance, we will always be on high alert and they will always respect our opinion. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Álvaro. This is exactly the kind of information our students need to better manage injuries in a, a professional uh, environment. So thank you very much. We will now carry on with uh, Sergio, finally. Uh, as I was saying earlier, Sergio has more than 20 years' experience working in the world of sports. Sergio. Over to you now. Thank you again, Alvaro. A pleasure to talk about that way of uh, taking care of sports people, because that's what we're here for. Well, I take this, what you're saying, that we have to be professionals, we have to, we are here for them. So I'm going to start saying and taking advantage of everything that Alvaro mentioned and following on it, because it was really important what he said. In this movie, the main character is the sports person, that's why we're here. Someone mentioned once, football is of footballers, not physiotherapists, not doctors, not ours, not uh, fans. Football is from footballers, at least in our framework of work. Sports is from sports people. That's why we're here. And uh, let's be a key to, to help them in everything possible. So what I'm here to tell you, it's a bit that work that we do on the backstage. I would like for you to know that something that we don't talk about in the classroom, that we usually don't talk about, is how to be prepared for a match or for a competition in a one sports or another. Because because it's true that it's really difficult to talk about it and the syllabus to give it some specific points. So I'm going to try to tell you as a journal, and I'm writing the journal and tell you what we do in a match day. For me, the most important thing that you have to remind on a match day is to be organized. We have to be organized. We have to know who we're working with. We have to know that we work with a sports team, with technical staff, with medical staff, with a professional. Knows, there's a team manager, a delegate, there's a person in charge of uh, the material who provides everything that is clothing and so on and so forth and that everything is ready. So we have to be organized. On a match day, what we need to do, the first thing you need to do is to be organized. Who do I work with? Who am I going to be with? Who am I going to work with? And you have to talk. You have to talk in a team. If I give you a clear example, when we work on a club or a federation, when we work on a new environment, maybe the most important thing for me is to ask the head coach, as they say in English, I believe it was very well translated in a so the head coach or the team leader who's the first coach of that uh, club or uh, national team how do they want to work with there's some want to work on the hotel before or this one to work just in the locker room or they don't care some want to give the talk and then have the warm-up some want to have the warm-up and then the talk so you have to get organized and based on what the head coach wants usually the that's the way we're going to handle times. Second, we have to be organized. First step, second step, third step, be organized. Because if you're organized, you're always going to do the same thing. You're going to repeat it on the right way. You're not going to forget about anything. And it's true that on a competition day, we cannot go back. We have to work. We have to do a specific thing. We have to do. We have to be organized because it's there's not a lot of time. There's not a lot of time for everything. We have to be agile. So if we are organized, we're going to be able to be 
able to do our job and to help the sport pers sports person to be as prepared as possible. And third, the, first, the best tip I can give you is focus. Unlike what Alvaro was saying, we are not the friends of the sports person. We are also no supporters of the club. We are professionals. Of course, we want our sports person to achieve the goal, to be the best at the competition or the match. For the team to win, we want that, that's what we want. But we are not supporters. We are not on a match to encourage or to run more, to win the match because of our chanting or applause. We are professionals who have to be focused on what's going on that day. And that's why our image, even from before the concentration, even from being there before the match, we have to be focused on what's going to happen. And that's um, the way we have to, why we have to organize. The first step is before we leave the concentration place. You may be gathered in a hotel or a sports facility. Sometimes you come from uh, home. Before you go in from the gathering place, you have to, I have to get my material ready. I have to get my stuff ready. I have to prepare it and I have to check it. We usually have a first aid. A to travel that has a lot more than what we're going to need in a trip. If you are taking a trip and there's some training apart from the mats, you're going to have the stuff you need for that training and for the mats. So you're going to have this uh, first aid kit that you're going to use and you're going to have a match first aid kit for for whatever you need uh, on the court or the pads. So I have to review everything, I have to see if everything I have is everything I need, if the amount of the different things is what probably I will be needing I'll to review the material, to review the stuff and order. First step, I review the material and I review it. I checked it yesterday. It's okay. I take another look because you have to be ready. Of course, we cannot forget about whatever we need in an emergency. Hopefully, that's the material we're never going to use. But if it's necessary, of course, we'll have to know where it is and if we have it on the proper state. This material only has to be used by qualified personnel and personnel who has been trained for it. That is, we cannot get to a match day or a training session and to use uh, different kind of things that are needed to be used in an emergency without having been trained for it. So I didn't have a first aid uh, training. I don't know what is uh, basic support. Okay, get trained, get educated. Of course, I want to be on the first line and I want to be the person who assists on the pitch. That's really beautiful for us to be able to do that. But you have to be ready for it because sometimes the assist is the common one. I go just a cold spray with an analgesic effect, maybe a small immobilization, some cream or something. We can do that easily. But if we're in an emergency situation, sometimes that demands a lot more and we have to be ready. Further to the, whatever we're going to use, of course, we have to establish the priority that we will behave and do our task according to the players' routines. As I've mentioned, sports is from sports people, so depending on the routine our players have, we will do that. When you work individually in an individual sports, for instance, tennis or swimming, each sports person has their own routine, and you have to adapt to that. Some may face the final of a Masters or an Open, and those uh, tennis players, maybe they have the final in the afternoon and they want to train in the morning as a pre-warm, others decide not to train and you have to be for there. So if they do not train in, we can do the work that we decide to do from physiotherapy. If they decide to train, we will have to adapt ourselves to that. Some players want to be treated before 
they get to the stadium or the place where the competition is going to happen. Others just want to do it before. Some want to get there sooner than rather than later, get out, warm up, sometimes do some uh, gymnastics uh, or gymnasium uh, work, and then our thing, their bandages, immobilizations, immobilizations or whatever. You have to know the routines. Uh, sometimes we work in a collective of sports, and there are many sports people write it down. You cannot remember all of it. Write it down and respect the routines, whether you like it or not. You have to respect respect routines and that's why i have always have to review okay i have all these sports people who do i have to bandage when who do i have to mobilize when what this is really important who wants to have heat uh, cream anti-inflammatory cream because what we cannot do is i apply a cream and then I wash my hands. We cannot waste time. We have to be agile to so get organized. Re review who wants to, who requires this or that, and then I get organized. If it's possible and the sports people organize, allows you uh, organize it according to tasks. So you don't have to wash your hands again and again to apply a bandage or then use uh, this cream or and then wash your hands and then apply another bandage is not as easy so try and organize in that sense another thing you can do and there you have the picture maybe mobilizations or creams i apply with uh, gloves that's a possibility having uh, said that get organized and do what you need to do the same way, before we leave the gathering place, I keep on thinking the way I've been saying. But sometimes I start working with a player in the hotel, in the hotel room, or the, the sports city, and I'm uh, mobilizing the player and even bandages a play, bandaging the place because that's what they require. And before leaving the hotel, I need to know what time we're going to leave so I get to the stadium or uh, whatever facility. And I need to have some time in advance to know what a sports person are going to be treating and do that even before reaching the facility. We leave the gathering uh, players to the stadium or facilities and the players are already thinking on the match, they're already focused, focused. So we have to be in the match already. The match is already being played. It's an important part. So they we have to be focused on what's going to happen in a few minutes and we keep on having our mind on that. We get to the competition uh, venue and if we're talking about football, and I tell you this framework because they're in football, there's more research and investigation, and FIFA and UEFA already have a regulation, medical regulation, and that medical regulation, for instance, they already established that there should be in the facilities a medical room with medical staff with an evacuation plan and that's why when we get to this facility we need to know where the medical room is who's the medical staff in the facility if you already have an evacuation plan or not and it's kind of a checklist but we say okay we know this and we know where this is located because sometimes you need to use it the same way that sometimes you're going to be able to need to transport a sport person with, because of an emergency situation or whatever, maybe because there was an important injury and you have to move the sports person to the hospital just because you there's some medical uh, checkup needed or radiological checkup or because we are before an emergency situation where it's important to transport a person to the hospital and we need to know where the ambulance is and to know the medical staff that we have available. The same way, you need to know where the closest hospital is. First, because maybe we're traveling with the team or the national team, we may be in a city that we, are, we don't know and we need to know how long it takes from the hotel to the hospital, from the facilities, the sports facilities to the hospital because that's the way in emergency situation is handled. It's really important to know this, to be able to be agile when handling that sports person. And then we get to the locker room. We get to the locker room and uh, the dance begins, as you are going to see, with a bit of a video.
como veis, cada vendaje es diferente. As you see, his bandage is different, its need is different. And that's where we have to remember its moment, who needs what. How each player wants to have what done, who wants to be mobilized first, and bandage wants bandage and then mobilize what they require to do amongst themselves. Also, notice how different people appear in the video. Physical trainer, doctor, coach. Staff, personnel, also see how important it is. And without any other thing, players warm up. Sometimes we need to do some activation tasks. We go with them to do that, to mobilize or to be available just for them observing whatever they need. And that's it. We have to be focused on the task to be available that they can see us. So we can provide whatever they need and just to remember you that during the match we have to be focused as I've mentioned we are not supporters we are professionals who have to analyze what's going on we have to be ready basically for hydration at least to help them every time they need it well they are playing they need some uh, assist to hydrate and to be ready and focus before in case of any intervention, especially the ones requiring an emergency because of the vital risk, but also if it's something urgent, we also have to be focused. So, thank you all. Thank you, Sergio. I believe like words like organization, focused, is uh, things that usually are not on scientific papers and are good to remember to be good professional. Without further ado, we continue with the debate table. Now with Dr. David Rodriguez, also David, physiotherapist and podologist, doctor in science of in health science who also devoted a good part of his life to um, professional physiotherapy and podology at the highest level. So, David, thank you again for being with us and for participating and always doing it in the best possible way and contributing with all your knowledge. Thank you. First, to thank the university, to thank the organization that they have me. I'm really happy to be able to talk about what I know and it's a luxury to share this table because sometimes uh, closeness makes us diff uh, confused and Alvaro and Sergio really close. And um, they do like this and the World Cup falls out of the pocket or the champions. So bear that in mind, their reference, take its gram of what they weigh because that's cool. So there was a component that was quite interesting that both of them talk a lot about details. There's a sentence I like a lot, that being lucky is an, a strict control of all details. So details is, uh, luck is to control all details to the maximum. And there's something I'm going to talk about. I've been researching this for my whole life. And we were talking about it uh, during the coffee. And I've been uh, um, studying about the Achilles tendon, the food, you know, that's my, the love of my life at the scientific level. And I was saying that I used a lot of time uh, doing uh, the sections. Uh, I always uh, um, playing with uh, body parts because that's the only way to keep on training, keep on training, keep on training. So you manage to understand that. I've been uh, doing this and working on this for 20 years and I keep on doing that for a really long time on the hind foot. We're going to talk about the hind foot, morphofunctional assessment on the sports people hind foot and there could be different ways to do that. So there you have it. So through social media you can 
provide a scientific uh, use, whether to follow cuts or more or less good mm, song singers, you can use it at a scientific level as well. So the hint foot is a very complex system. I'm going to talk about uh, some evidence because I want you to have the details because it's important because at the end of the day we have pressure points and in the middle we have tension lines and these are the architectonical models that we see currently where the profile you're going to see is that it's a system that's going to have some viscoelastic features where we're going to have some compressive strengths that are going to develop over the bone and it's going to uh, generate interaction in the soft tissue of the tendon and fascia associated to that tension component. And we need to understand that different parts have different functions and receive different feature, mechanical features, but it's not just these are not the only values to bear in mind. So I'll give you a list of the main clinical entities that are, have interest on the hind foot, and there are tons of them. We're going to have musculotendinous uh, components, articular components, soft tissue components, neurological components, vascular components, ascendant and descendant components. We're going to have the fascia component. We're going to find all kinds of components components on a profile that you can fit in the fist. So we have to be very specialized to be able to understand everything that happens there. When assessing, there are many components to do that assessment. Clinical history, we can have biomechanical analysis, we can have uh, footwear analysis, load analysis, uh, biomechanical analysis, pressure. So this is like a shopping list. And I have the idea that it's nothing more dangerous when you get to the birthday or to Christmas time and they say, I'm going to go uh, downtown to see what I find. And that's what happened in the emails. You may go to the downtown and say, OK, I'm going to buy something for Christmas, and you can leave with 100,000 bucks. And that information is useless. We don't know what we're looking for. There's a really beautiful tale from Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland, and there's a moment where Alice finds a cat, and the cat says, Alice asks the cat, and uh, what's the uh, path? Because there's a crossword. And the cat said, if you don't know where you're going to go, the path doesn't matter. So you have to be really careful when you ask, and technological advanced computation, quantum computation, and all those things, is that we went from the famous big data to the famous smart data. And that changes. We have to be quite selective on the information when and where it comes from. One of the parts, of course, and is uh, really important, tendinopathy uh, is uh, going to be a part of most of the consultations. You have to be really a specialist, and I'm in love with the clistem, so I have to mention it. And I'm going to tell you a number of assessments that we can perform that are from our interest. We know that patients having ten Achillean tendinopathy, the fat changes, the inclination uh, angle changes, and the tendon changes. But this is interesting data, and you can find them even before pain appears. And you can find, do the work Alvaro and Sergius were saying, I anticipate what's going to happen. I don't wait for my patient to break, because I know what's going to happen. That's the way it is. They're going to start breaking and happen. And, uh, an ultrasound scan, and I see that 75% uh, of it was broken. And before 70, it was 40 and 30 and nothing. It was just out there. There were biomechanical alterations. And with this assessment, Alvaro and Sex, you mentioned, you anticipate to that development. We don't get to 60% broken, which is a lot uglier than uh, solve and a lot more complicated to solve. And that's what they were saying about anticipating and knowing all different features. Another important thing that we find in the assessment of fascia is that closest when there's a poor tendon, the closest to the fascia is the one that is uh, altered. As a matter of fact, plantar fat is uh, altered, and this is one of the best bumpers from the body. I like to lo talk about this a lot. Probably we all hear in our training, in our education, that when the fat from the tendon decreases, there could be um, pain on the heel, but ne they never say the thickness. So from our investigation group, we were the first one that 
give this a full name on an average grown person, they have to have these millimeters, and it's published. And these are the details. When someone gets there to a consultation, we have a sport person, and the ankle is um, in pain if it's less than 920, line 15, and it's a man. It may be because of that. And this is a specific piece of information, and that's why it's important to know all those details, to see how the muscle from the foot works. When the colleagues were talking about that, you have to look at everything. You have to look absolutely everything from, you need to worry from the papilloma that you get in the alloys to the L4, L5, that's half a dehydrated discs because they are as important. Some discs are disaster and the patient is going to notice when they retire. One day that will fall because it was and the uh, disc was dehydrated for half a life. So you have to bear in mind all those factors. The morphological, the functional, the emits and the diagnosis parts and the rest of the exploration that you perform at the clinical level. Some of you already know about this within that functional assessment. This is an elite sports person, and this is a publication from a test that we made up. We've been investigating for 20 years on the Achilles tendon, and we managed to develop a specific test that is going to be published. It's the VIT test, and you can imagine why it's called the VIT test. I had to get my own test. After studying this for the whole life, I have to give this some light. And it has an 86% of sensitivity and 100% of uh, reliability. And it's based on fat. When Kagger fat, it's on dorsiflexion. You have a profile, two belly, with two lines to the sides. And when that's symmetric, it's closely related to the patient having uh, this organized collagen on fibers because of the impact. So it's interesting just because, uh, just for you to know about it. So uh, this is like TV. The first time you saw it was here. More interesting data that for our sports people. It's a publication we did it associated with a, a PhD thesis on what changes on a patient and has a uh, instability, chronic instability. Uh, this is uh, like untangled, so everything was changed. And all these things you're saying from the muscle, from the, these are points that the physiotherapist needs to work. And you would not know how many ankles are damaged, especially in basketball. We work with many sports people, and they have instability, not because they have one sprain one day, but because they had one sprain, they competed, they had another one, they competed, they had a season, they had an important injury, because when someone's going to take a rebound, it's not just by yourself. When the Alvarez players go to a corner, they don't get an aisle to get there, and people are pointing when they need to go. One of the things but uh, so as in the COVID time, is that the whole time what you hear is pumping to each other. Would you going to uh, work with sports people more? There is always concussions. More things that we can analyze is a thermographic uh, analysis, which is this is one of the elements that, uh, like on the previous time from 2000 to 20. 20, it's the ultrasound, and I'm sure that next decade we are going to use thermography. One of the things, this is all publications, and they say that the structures, when biomechanically they're not working properly, they have a thermal image. And we have another publication saying that you never need to have a huge, expensive gun. This is a study we did from with a study which contacted us, PC America, for a development of validating the device. And we saw that the most important thing is the really personalized analysis, what they were saying, really personalized analysis. When I know that you are 170 high, that your quadriceps is 68, that your calf is 65, it's a lot easier for, to have less mistakes because I know exactly your image at every given time and any change I know what's going on and that's quality to have all that information this is the pressure platform as a 
capabilities, as you know, with this, one of the things I would like to say is that uh, plantar pressure is an answer that would tell us whether the tissue is supporting more than they need it. And sometimes it would happen that you have, you're working with colleagues or you're working by yourself, and they can always add more pressure and more pressure and more pressure. And there's a given moment where a specific thing blows you up. There are no more paper in the photocopy, and then everything is important. And that's what happens. There are moments where we have average moments that are so high that uh, it's bad. So the success is do that screen, do that analysis, and with all these anal tools, do that. So a bit for you to know about it, we have these morphofunctional parts of the food and um, health professionals with all problems. And one of the main problems is the uh, dorsal flexion of the ankle, because if that doesn't work, nothing works. In the whole limb, actually, all of these components that you see here can have repercussions on electrographic components, torsion, a number of things. So that's something you have to take into account. This is a very important element, the most important element in our checklist, in fact. There are lots of scientific articles uh, about this. They're quite boring, but uh, they all say the same thing. If there is no dorsal flexion in the ankle, the whole limb eventually fails. So any mobility issue affecting lower limbs should include uh, a sort of treatment for dorsiflexion because that's the first element that becomes affected by that. Now, a problem that we've experienced many, many times in our profession, I always say that uh, this is the most beautiful profession in the world because we help people and there's nothing better than helping people uh, to get back to tip-top shape, to be in tip-top um, um, health, helping healthy people to become healthier, athletes to perform better. Um, in uh, physical therapy, we always talk about Maitland, Mulligan, McConnell, McKenzie. This is technical information. Uh, but Sergio and Alvaro um, were saying, you are scientists. And so we need to turn the situation around. Instead of thinking about M's, think about W's. Flip the letter around. This is what you should focus on when it comes to managing athletes. Techniques is something everyone can learn in four months, right? In four months, you can learn how to do a McDonald bandage. But you need four years to find out exactly when you have to do it. And you also have to know who does. Uh, who applies a technique, what technique is applied, why, where, when, etc. I think that's a lot more important. If you're able to think like that, that's much, much better uh, than learning techniques. Techniques can be learned. Anyone can learn them. A butcher who's been uh, um, filleting meat for 45 years can probably handle a knife better than a surgeon. I don't mean to disrespect anyone, obviously. Uh, but the, the difference between a butcher and a surgeon is that the surgeon has a method, a scientific method that they employ. That was all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I didn't bore you, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I think the last th thing you mentioned is particularly important. Think as clinicians. Don't think about what you should use. Think about when you should use it. And this is pretty much what um, everyone else has said so far. Our profession is basically a collection of uh, different elements that should be kept in perfect balance all the time. Now, without further ado, I'd now like to kick off our Q&A uh, session. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please ask away. Okay, we have a question down there.
que respecto a Ay. la prevención que habéis dicho que hay que tener para, bueno, para prevenir lesiones antes de que ocurran, ¿tenéis como una About injury prevention. que hagáis a inicio de temporada? Are there any tests you like to run at the beginning of the season in order to find out whether the athlete is at risk of getting injured in any particular way? I love that question because I love prevention. That's something we don't often talk about in sports because we tend to focus on the short term. But prevention is absolutely paramount. It's a little difficult to show that our work can contribute uh, to preventing athletes from getting injured, but it can be shown that we can reduce certain risk factors. Yes, there is a whole plethora of tests that can be uh, done pre-season. Um, and then repeated throughout the season to predict a number of different things. But it depends on the athlete, on the position they play in, on their life actually, their personal life as well. So all of these factors determine what tests you're going to run. For a swimmer, for example, you're going to run different tests than a tennis player, a football player or a basketball player because they're different athletes, whether they're male or female, that's also an important factor. Sex is an important factor when it comes to injury prevention, so that needs to be taken taken into account. Um, prior injuries is also something that should be taken into account because, uh, of course, uh, prior injuries are likely to reoccur, more likely than others anyway, and so you, you should have to measure mobility, balance, strength, a number of anthropometric metric parameters. Uh, but depending on the sport, you have to run different tests. You can uh, pick out your your own blend of tests right before the season begins. If you like, you can map out a number of other tests that you want to run throughout the season. That's pretty much how we work, and that's something we teach in the Masters. In fact, um, we teach our students what functional tests can be used for certain parts of the body, and then based on the results of those tests, we develop our protocols. Thank you. Sorry. At the beginning of the season, like Sergio and David have said, we run tests on the areas affected by prior injuries on the athletes. We look for scar tissue. We try and determine where the scarring has occurred. Um, we construct, we build a timeline of uh, injuries uh, and we sort them by muscle group and then let me tell you this i don't know if this is useful uh, for us it's a useful notion to to have uh, athletes get bored generally when uh, we test them um, so it's not advisable i suppose to have an athlete um, do tests for four hours uh, straight. Uh, we generally divide that up into several different testing sessions, uh, let's say three, four uh, pre-season. And so we work with them for 15, 20 minutes, half an hour a day. Uh, and then after we run our tests, they can go back to training. And uh, uh, this is, you know, not as boring to them. And we still get our results. Thank you. Hello. When an elite athlete comes to your um, center, do you also get in touch with their club? Because generally within a club, each player, each athlete has a different coach, a different um, set of technicians that help. What do you do? Uh, it depends on the sport. In certain sports, it's very, very easy to get in touch with a club uh, after an athlete comes to see us. Uh, it's actually very nice to do that. Um, 
in sports where a lot of money is at stake, uh, this process, of course, is a little more difficult because they have a larger staff, they have their own staff. Um, so uh, this makes it a, li a, little, a little harder. Um, in football, for example, there are a number of patterns that we're aware of, match day, uh, training days, and uh, so we're able to plan our interventions accordingly. And we do have to talk to the clubs because it's important to do that with some clubs. We talk to daily with, for example, a lot of tennis players and swimmers. We talk directly to the athlete and to their uh, technical staff on a daily basis. Uh, but sometimes in team sports, um, yes, we do talk to physicians or f physical therapists, but sometimes we can't do that and we have to talk to the club first. Anyway, uh, communication is fundamental across the board. You can't um, you can't just have a player remove four of his or her wisdom teeth all of a sudden. I ask you, where do we draw the line between um, the um, friendship relationship and the professional uh, relationship between the physio and the athlete? Because especially when we work in a club, they tend to, to see us as their family and psychologists at the same time. And if we are not there for them to listen to their problems or if we don't go to their homes when they invite us, then they feel that we are against them. So they don't prefer to come to us as they did before. Okay, I understand you, but I have to uh, answer you in, in Spanish, okay, please. So I'm going to listen to you in English. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes, that is actually uh, a bit of a difficult moment in our profession. Just to give you an idea, just to give you an idea, a lot of athletes don't come to us. They prefer us. They, they prefer that we go to them many, many times. Every week, actually, I have to do this. I have to go see my athletes where they train or where they live, okay? That's possible. But it is one thing to have a close relationship with an athlete, whereby sometimes they share um, certain things with you, and it's a whole other things to overstep that line and become their friend, okay? If an athlete has been experiencing certain psychological issues, then they have to talk to a sports psychologist. If they are struggling with nutrition, for example, we had an athlete uh, not too long ago who refused to take uh, creatine, which enjoys a, a huge body of evidence. It, it is very effective. It's the most important supplement, creatine, and this athlete wouldn't take it then they need to talk to a nutritionist. It's, 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 it's a little difficult uh, with some people I've been working with for eight years and I know their wives, their daughters, their sons. But still, I'm their physical therapist and they're my athlete. We have a beautiful relationship, but we're not friends. Hola a todos. Hello. Thank you very much for your presentations. I'm from Turkey. I'm sorry if my Spanish is not up to standard. I think you can understand me, but if you prefer, I can speak in English or in Turkish, whatever you prefer. I'm a physical therapist, um, and I also work at the Fenerbahce University in Turkey. I work with a number of athletes myself. And I wanted to ask you uh, about cultural differences. I'm a sports physical therapist, and 
Sometimes I think I've noticed that uh, culture can have an impact on how close you get to an athlete. Would you agree with that? That's an interesting question. I think Sergio should answer that question. I mostly work with footballers, uh, football players, uh, people from a number of different countries, uh, and that's been very, very enriching for me personally. I've realized that Spanish people are very, very direct. Yes, hello, how are you? Meet you at four o'clock. That's how we go about things. Argentinian people, Mexican people, Colombian people generally ask, how are you? And if the athlete doesn't say, I'm fine, they don't ask any follow-up questions. This is an example. This is an example of a cultural difference, and that's something I learned when I worked with a Mexican athlete for the first time in my life. Yes, cultural differences uh, do have a big impact, but again, I think Sergio should uh, answer this this question. I've worked with people from maybe 10 different countries. Sergio's worked with people from a thousand different countries. Yes, culture is very important. Outside of the locker room, you need to be able uh, to ensure that you smooth out cultural differences with your athlete outside of the locker room. Inside of the locker room, you can have people um, from different religions, Orthodox, Christians, Catholics, uh, Muslims, it can happen. And that is something you need to be able to handle. Culture, of course, also plays an impact. The way you address a person changes the relationship you create with them. Luckily, um, I think women's sports have been becoming increasingly important, thankfully. Uh, and I've uh, realized that uh, there are differences between uh, genders, sexes as well. Uh, men and women tend to operate at different paces, and that's something you need to be aware of. Multiculturality and adaptation are paramount. You need to be able to adapt. And as Alvaro was saying, you have to learn uh, how to work with different cultures. Like Alvaro, Alvaro gave us an example about the, me the Mexican athlete. Um, it comes with challenges, all of this, but it's beautiful challenges. On a personal and professional level, you grow so much and you will never forget about this your whole life. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very, very happy to be here. As a sports physical therapist, I feel uh, this is an important issue uh, for us. Thank you. Last question. I have a question for David, mostly. Uh, I've always been prone to ankle sprains. You talked about a reduction in uh, dorsal flexion, but uh, I was wondering if there are any factors uh, that make an athlete prone to this kind of injury. Thank you for your question. We actually wrote an article with the Tehran University, um, and the issues seems to stem mostly from the uh, median glute. We've realized that most morphofunctional changes uh, stem from uh, the median glute. Uh, that has an immediate impact on dorsal flexion. Uh, so what you need to strengthen is your core and your median glute. There is a publication about this. Uh, I encourage you to read it. Uh, easy answer, median glute. Very well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Events, well, talks like this one uh, are truly, truly enriching for all of us. There's going to be a short break now, and then we'll kick off our second round table where we'll be.
Buenos días, continuamos con la, el cuarto encuentro internacional de profesionales de la lesión deportiva. En este caso, esta mesa de medicina del, del deporte viene acompañada por el patrocinio de Helios Electromedicina, que es una empresa muy importante que desarrolla dispositivos asociados a which manufactures uh, medical devices that can be used um, with your athletes. So I'd like to thank this company for their support. Muchas gracias. Eh, pasamos con el primer Thank you. El okay. Luis Our first speaker is Dr. Uh, José Luis Abad Morenilla. His former director of the Fremap Hospital is currently a sports medicine consultant at the Centro Clinic. It's a reference in sports traumatology, so anything I could say would fall short, really. So over to you, Professor. Thank you, David. I would like to take this opportunity to tell you that uh, I absolutely loved today's first round table. Theory is great. Studying is great. But then it's also important to have practical examples of what you can do in your day-to-day -day life as a practitioner. Alvaro Sergio talked to us about what they do in their day-to-day -day lives. They talked to us about what they do in the locker rooms, the importance of studies in uh, pedology. That's an invaluable contribution. And that's something I had to find out for myself. I work at a very big center now and uh, we deal with uh, sometimes severe traumas and injuries so that's my experience working with athletes many many times i wondered uh, what it would be like to be part of a team where you share literally everything with your athlete, their grief, their sorrows, their joys when they win. So congratulations, uh, really. So once again, um, I first started to work with athletes working in traumatology. I'd like to thank Ms. Sato, David, Sergio, Alvaro, Diego. Thank you for inviting me once again to take part in this event. Uh, I'm here today to share my knowledge with you. Um, nothing new, really. But I will be trying in my talk to give you a bit of a personal interpretation of um, how certain things are done. I'm here to talk to you about sports uh, traumas and how we deal with them at our um, uh, center. Particularly, I'd like to talk about the carpus, how we deal with those injuries. I'll tr try to make this entertaining. I wouldn't want you to get bored. 
and I'll be trying to explain uh, to you how you can approach these um, injuries when they need to be treated. Now, before I begin, uh, just a quick reminder of the anatomy of the carpus. This is how the this is how the carpus uh, looks. This is part of the uh, uh, structure. We have the ulna, the radius, etc., that determine how uh, the area moves. We have capsules and external elements that uh, stabilize the the carpus. It is a structure of tendons and muscles and blood vessels and nerves all around the carpus, as you know. This is what we act on as physicians, and we need to be aware of how these can be manipulated. This is the range of motions that this joint uh, has. Uh, we'll be addressing this very, very quickly. The carpian uh, radius is very, very um, important, as you know, the metacarpian carpus as well. All of these elements play a pivotal role. But uh, to better understand uh, how injuries can be uh, treated in this area, we need to become familiar with the various elements of, of, the, the, of the area. Uh, this is a list of the structures of the elements that can become injured. The synovial capsule on the outside with all the ligaments that strengthen the joint. These are ext uh, extrinsic. Uh, ligaments outside of the capsule we also have a few other structures which also support the joint and they can uh, become injured as well they can lead to certain pathologies now factors that contribute to creating problems in the carpus area the first thing we need to understand is what happened and how. That information can help us uh, figure out how exactly the carpus was damaged. In uh, sports, a lot of the traumas uh, that occur due to accidents, for example, uh, I don't know, if you get hit, on your carpus uh, by a hockey stick, that's not very common. But certain um, movements uh, outside of the metacarpal structure's range of motion can lead to injuries that are predictable. Mechanically, discomfort can be generated when an athlete repetitively performs one mechanical uh, motion. A tennis player, for example, it's the same movement over and over again that can lead to injury, uh, more or less severe injuries, homolateral motions, for example, um, uh, other factors can be whether you're whether you got injured in your dominant hand or or in the other one, and where does this happen? One potential cause is uh, occupational hazards. There are, of course, domestic accidents as well, the, and traffic accidents, car crashes. Uh, that can also be a um, pivotal cause for these injuries. Uh, as sports can be as well, in teenagers, uh, amateurs, professional athletes, some prof uh, amateurs, as you will see in your careers, actually train more than professional athletes and they can get injured too. So all of these can be causes for these injuries. How can these injuries be categorized? Let's come up with a definition for what it is we're talking about. What is 
a, um, an accident in sports. It's a sudden event affecting the athlete, which restricts the athlete's capability to train for a period of time. If it's a, a serious injury, then the athlete won't be able to train for a long time. If it isn't, the athlete won't be able to train for less time. In the case of uh, light injuries, uh, the, these will be a lot more common. We have contusions, we have wounds, we have light strains, uh, instability, uh, laxity in the joint, and uh, functional overload. That's, that's very, very common, okay? And all of these processes generate mechanical pain, which don't let the athlete play, uh, train, perform, compete, um, perform up to standard, basically. And these uh, are relatively difficult to diagnose. Serious injuries, however, is slightly different. We have complex wounds, um, ligament trauma, instability, uh, fiber cartilage injuries, fractures, and a number of other things. These are serious injuries. And these are actually easier for us because most of these need to be treated uh, with surgery, for example, in the case of um, uh, dislocations, uh, luxations, in the case of torn ligaments, you need surgery. Um, so these would be athletes who come to us because they need help. And when they do come, the first thing we need to do is a medical history. In the previous round table, we saw how important it is to perform a series of actions in order to uh, find out what sort of injuries the athlete is prone uh, to incur. Uh, we talked about how important it is to run specific tests pre-season, for example. And there are a number of things we can do ourselves to find out to what extent the patient is injured and what kind of treatment is optimal for the specific situation. So medical history first. Exploration comes second. We study the range of motion. Uh, of the carpus. Uh, we won't always be able to rely on MRIs. Of course, MRIs help, but it's much, much better to come up with the diagnosis before the uh, MRI is actually done. Uh, and not all of our patients will be able to afford uh, these expenses, and we need to be able to diagnose before an MRI without an MRI. Uh, some clubs as well. Even some clubs, for example, don't have access to the same tests as a wealthier one. So you need to be able to diagnose without an MRI. And once you diagnose your athlete with the actual injury that's been incurred, then you can treat them. But what is it you need to come up with the right diagnosis? Now, let's spend a couple of minutes to talk about joint pain, uh, non-specific joint pain. These photographs, I think, are about 20 years old, okay? So, uh, a man came to me saying that his wrist hurt, and he showed up with uh, the wrist braces you uh, can see in the picture. And I asked him, OK, your wrist really hurts, doesn't it? His wrist had been bothering him for six years. He hadn't been able to achieve a full functional recovery. Why? Well, because often wrist injuries are difficult to diagnose. And they often occur due to functional syndromes or mechanical syndromes arising out of um, injuries. 
but they're not easy to diagnose. A fracture, for example, when the carpus is split open down the middle, that's easy to diagnose. But everything that's arthritis, arthrosis, synovitis, uh, torn intrinsic ligaments, chondropathy, functional syndromes, SCT alteration, uh, parajoint pain, that's difficult. Uh, to diagnose and uh, for as long as the pain is there the athlete can't train the athlete can't compete the athlete can't perform up to standard and what they need is often symptomatic treatment or even surgery like on like an arthroscopy which can help us determine what's wrong within the joint Sometimes this pain is very, very persistent. It goes on for months or years even. The first thing we need to do is rule out a number of pathologies such as tendonitis, neuritis, which can be tested for, and they express an objective damage. You get an MRI to see a fracture or a specific type of injury but again you can't always perform an MRI on the wrist so you need to rule those out first and now I'd like to talk about how you can come up with the right treatment for these injuries light injuries require symptom specific treatment serious injuries require yes specific medical treatment of course physical therapy or surgery even. This is a list of possible uh, non-specific pathologies of the area that might need to be treated. And depending on uh, what happened, different treatment is required. If the scaphoid is uh, torn, then surgery. Um, in other cases, a manipulation could be enough. This is an example of a scaphoid fracture. Obviously, a scaphoid fracture causes uh, athletes after five, ten days to maybe recover a little bit and get back to work. But that's uh, terrible for the long-term health of the scaphoid of the joint. In that case, what you need is surgery. But that's something that's obviously done in the hospital. So people will generally come to see you after the surgery because they need to recover from the surgery itself. Arthroscopy is very, very important for the wrist, as it is for the knee, for example. It's very, very important when pain is non-specific because sometimes you do your arthroscopy and it looks like the patient has nothing wrong with them. Uh, mind you, the arthroscopy doesn't only have to be uh, diagnostic in its purpose. It can be used to perform surgery and treat uh, an injury in the wrist, arthroscopy. Meniscus tears, for example, those are fixed using arthroscopy. Arthroscopy for the wrist is uh, just as decisive and necessary as meniscus surgery. You can use it to fix the cartilage. Um, a fiber cartilage injury is difficult to diagnose using imaging. Uh, you need to run some complementary tests as well. For example, if the wrist tends to click, and you find out that there's a little piece of cartilage that's torn and is infiltrating the joint, then arthroscopy, you remove it. Chondral injuries, you can use arthroscopy for those as well, with good prognoses. Synovial injuries with specific synovitis and inflammatory processes that causes pain, um, inability to train, cubital carpian compression that compromises the ulna and the carpus and causes quite a lot of pain and can possibly become chronic, this type of discomfort. 
So we've covered a number of uh, pathologies already. Most of them were intra-joint. Extra-joint pathologies, we have synovitis, tenosynovitis, ganglions, cysts, uh, carpal tunnel uh, issues, issues with the ulna, uh, even tumors. Uh, tumors and uh, ganglions can be removed uh, using arthroscopy as well. Tendinitis of the flexors with irritation of the median nerve. That's something you will definitely see. Uh, in uh, your practice because it's a consequence of, again, a repetitive uh, sports uh, practice. This uh, is a tenosynovitis of the extensors. Uh, happens quite frequently uh, in tennis players. Tennis players can suffer from this relatively commonly and they uh, might even be unable to play for up to three months if they uh, don't uh, undergo surgery. Now to conclude, in traumatic pathologies, non-specific pain is going to give you quite a few headaches. Well, it's going to give our athletes quite a few headaches as well because they can't train. Tendinitis, for example, if you don't stop training and keep on training for four, five, six months, can become chronic. Compression syndromes cubital carpi and compression syndromes, affecting the ulna, the carpus, or both. The generally mechanical response of monolateral uh, loads that are borne by the joint uh, recurrently, and uh, carpion canal, sorry, carpion tunnel syndrome. Uh, all of these can be difficult to diagnose, but they all have a correct treatment although it's not apparent at first. So in my talk, I just wanted to talk about the simplicity and the, sorry, the simplicity and complexity uh, of these injuries. When our athletes start saying, I can't train anymore, then a number of bells start ringing. And as you can see, it doesn't, the, there doesn't need to be something broken for the athlete not to be able to train. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abad. Uh, we'll now be talking to Dr. Calero. He's actually at work. Uh, he's an expert in sports medicine. Um, he is part of the medical staff of Real Betis Balompier, uh, the football team, uh, been part of the teaching staff since 1997. Thank you very much for coming here today. Over to you, Professor. We currently cannot hear the speaker from the English booth. We apologize. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Women's football. It's a little difficult to talk about the differences between women's and men's football in 15 20 minutes. I'll be trying to keep this as dynamic as possible. I'll be talking about my personal experience, what I've found in my practice over the years. Generally speaking, I think that uh, after so many years of experience, um, hopefully, I have quite a few interesting uh, things to share with you, and I'll be trying to talk about the differences between men's football and women's um, uh, football, focusing on women's football, however. So, in my professional um, career, uh, I've been working with Real Betis, uh, with the 
their first team for over 28 years now. But in the past seven years, I've specialized in women's football. I've been working with the Spanish international team and the Real Betis women's football team. And since I started doing that, uh, I've learned a lot of uh, new things as a professional. Specifically, uh, I think it's become apparent that women's football is here to stay. It's growing so much and it's a beautiful sport. Uh, it's the most widely practiced women's sport in the world. 26 million women practice it over 180 countries, professionally or semi professionally. The last World Cup took place in uh, England, as you know, uh, 7,000 referees, 21,000 coaches, 53 countries have uh, international um, teams. But again, the sport is practiced in 180. So hopefully, the sport will keep on growing. Um, more and more over the years. Now, in the last World Cup, which took place in England, once again, we had 87,000 viewers at the stadium watching the final between England and Germany. The whole tournament was viewed by about 600,000 people live in the stadiums, with an average of viewers per match of 18,000 people. So again, this shows that the sport is growing. This is no longer about just a handful of girls playing football, no. Uh, women's football is here to stay. We've seen this at the World Cup. And uh, in fact, it was hugely covered by the press and commercials worldwide, so we'll keep on growing. These are figures regarding Spain. Spain lost out to England in uh, the round of 16. The match was watched by 2.4 million people. Uh, and this shows that in Spain, too, women's football is growing steadily. Scientifically speaking, at the same time, women's football is also being studied. The Cougat Institute organizes an annual conference, and this year, they published uh, an article where um, researchers studied a certain pathology in women, in women athletes. So women's uh, football uh, is currently being looked at by uh, scientists as well, specifically. Uh, the um, Spanish Association of uh, Sports uh, uh, Physicians convened last year, uh, as it does every year, and we had a roundtable about women's football. We talked about uh, the phenotypes of uh, women, uh, how they perform in sports, uh, what injuries they're more likely to be affected by, and so on and so forth. Now, physiological characteristics differentiating uh, men and women. Women's football can't be compared to men's football. These matches are very, very different from one another. If you like men's football, eventually I think you will uh, grow to enjoy women's football uh, as well. But it is a fact that women's football is less physical, less direct, uh, slightly less fast. Uh, physiologically speaking, um, women athletes are slightly less strong, but it's more technical. Women, women tend to play more as a team. They try and hold possession for longer than men. 
women basically have different physical characteristics from men which cause them to play differently and so women's football is different from men's football. It's difficult to compare the two and obviously no one can say which one is better or which one is worse. They're different. Both um, types have advantages and disadvantages and so there will be things maybe that uh, people won't like about women's football but there will definitely be things that they will uh, absolutely love and the same goes for men's football and uh, about the physiopathology of injuries 80 percent of injuries in women's football seem to occur out of direct uh, contact uh, crash with another athlete women seem to be more prone to certain injuries than men because of their biomechanic characteristics. Uh, knees seem to hyperextend more in girls. Uh, external rotation in the shin bone seems to be um, more uh, seems to have a uh, larger range of motion than men, and so on and so forth. And this can cause different injuries, physiological characteristics. There are differences between men and women here as well. Women have a VO2 max that's slightly um, below men's... Uh, the, the threshold uh, of men, yo-yo intermittent endurance, is slightly higher. Uh, sprinting time over 20 meters is slightly um, slower. And so that's something we need to take into account when uh, women are treated for their injuries. Yo-yo strength, VO2 max, sprinting time, all of these are factors that I think as medical professionals we should take into account when treating women. These are data uh, that we use very, very often. No doubt girls have their own features, footballers, but it's true that the um, menstrual cycle is very much a study and we know that it participates a lot in the pre uh, in the stress and it would make them more prone to injuries or not. It would produce some uh, uh, viscous lassitude at the ligament and tendons level and that which is a factor that would enable of not having pathologies by overload. It's also true that it's a process that facilitates risks to decrease the performance and sometimes injuries are more serious. Lately, in the last study we had at the beginning in the Institute about DASI, we assessed that in the we saw in the previlatory phase uh, 100, the last 150 injuries and we saw that that would uh, increase the incidence there were more problems in the anterior ligament than in other cases and also uh, continued use of uh, anticonceptives may decrease reactive strength the contraceptive may reduce the the strength and we've seen that in different research so this is from knowledge but also to assess a bit physiological features of women among other factors the most important ones that we are going to find is that to achieve to their target weight or the competitive weight is going to be a lot more difficult than for guys guys maybe with their Uh, weekly impedance or senior anthropometry monthly 95 98 percent of possibilities of acquiring the target weight and sometimes it's more difficult with women especially also because of the whole hormonal system they have during their 
ovulation period, but also what we are noticing and we're seeing to try and find that volatility that biopensy provides at the weekly level. We have an hormonal study in psychometry at the Dexafit and that provides a lot more information regarding the real fat percentage that we can compete with the muscle weight and from that we can define their competitive weight. This is a bit of an observation that sometimes uh, and that you need to know that we would need uh, uh, to define the ideal weight in a different way. Going into different pathologies that are different regarding men and women, maybe not to bore you, I'm going to give you the most interesting stuff to assess the project in the last year, what we did last year. No doubt, muscle pathologies, you need to know that they have more of them because of overload. After each match, they usually have more pathologies in that sense. They always mention that they have situations that are a bit more of uh, overload, uh, injuries and ischies and uh, quadriceps. And as we've mentioned, the hormonal incidence and the laxitude, due, it would depend on an estrogen stimulation the muscle injuries usually are less abundant, but when they happen, they're usually more serious. They don't have uh, the uh, rectum breaks in a uh, serious way, as with the ischias, when they break, it's usually a subfacial pathology in general or degree one or two maximum and it's a strange to see is full tendon break-ins but it's also true that when that happens they're usually more dramatic than the one in men and also there are contusions they've mentioned something but they were speaking at the same time so i couldn't understand I'm sorry Regarding ligament pathology, you know that they have more incident on the anterior cruciate ligament. And the cruciate ligament is 6 to 1 as compared with men. And regarding the other LCA in the, the medial collateral of the knee and the ankle are the ones that have more cases. You would have to define the most frequent one, I would say, spring ankles. That's the one they get more. So we have to be careful. And as David mentioned before, we need to have preventive work on pathology, not just at the stabilization level, but also to stabilize that I share a lot that we need to stay supplied with you in medium glute and power. Regarding tendinous pathologies, yeah, usually the uh, abductors suffer more, more incidents also in Achilles tendon and Rotulian, but this is usually in I've seen it mainly in more veteran uh, women and that have some uh, obvious overweight, but in general, tendinous injuries are less serious than with men. Usually is the one that is the tendon together with the abductors that they don't break, but they have a serious overload that would have to have a specific treatment. Regarding the bone ones by itself, obviously, is not more or less incident as compared with uh, men, as compared with a trauma, because they have a less, they have less bone injuries, but the ones we have are break-ins in the phalanx, 
and, uh, and uh, food, but in usually breaking the fifth meta in the food is less. In men, we usually have around two, three per season, and in women, we have one every two or three seasons. Regarding the periostasis, is more or less similar, and less uh, because of overuse and L1 and L5. So spondylysis degree one is less in women, and in hand pathologies, there are more direct contact among themselves. It's present. But you have to bear in mind that the summary of this slide is that everything is by a, um, bone stress. So at the column level is less in women than in men. Regarding general pathologies that may happen in football, of course, the most women are more susceptible to have incidents of chronocephalic trauma, even at the as they have a lot less uh, head hidden with the ball than men, although it's less volume of that hitting. The incidence on the strength is weaker, so it may happen more often, especially because they have less volume of contrast uh, strength and uh, muscles in the neck. And it's true that the ones that are derived from craniocephalic trauma are more present than in men. But regarding all the other ones, less insufficient on the inguinal ring, less in the cox femoral impingement, uh, less suitable injuries, less shoulder pathologies because they fall less than men, and incidents at growth pathology regarding muscles and calcification as they usually have are less aggressive on the hormonal exploitation as compared with men. There's less strength and therefore this pathology that usually happens at uh, the uh, growth cartilage is less than in women than men. With all of that, this is a bombing of tons of classifications, but mainly for you to have an idea of what are the main features. But if I have to take something home, in general, I can say that we're talking about when we see in women, there's an important androgenization of their bodies. We have an example of a goalkeeper that in four months, the defini uh, definition of her body is a lot more clear. It wouldn't be important, as I've mentioned at the beginning, not to compare male football and female football. They're independent with the uh, features and virtues and defects, women usually have a lot more injuries by direct contact. So if you're in a, a food, female football match, you will have to pay a lot of attention during the match because there will be more direct contact. Sprang ankles are the main pathology. The question is, how can we decrease that percentage of LCA on the anterior cruciate? That's the investigation, but year after year, we cannot decrease that. And the last study we had was on the put There was a uh, podiatrist congress if it would be better to have round wood uh, and the uh, period usually half amenorrhea and that's not a deficit component to bear in mind but at sometimes it's together with the way they train and the normal features and we that what i would like to say is that their eruption in the world of football and especially in professional sports it's starting to be strong and the best is yes to come and we're finding more and more that we're going to get used to see more women football matches and this is going to happen more and more. And to finish, I would like to say that we cannot forget that Spain is a world champion in sub-17 and sub-20, so the new generation 
uh, female who come morphologically defined uh, women who have a physical preparation and psychological training that is uh, very good. I was able to work both in sub-17 and sub-20. I'm proud of this new generation of women who are going to participate in our country to be a flagship to follow around the world. And I believe that they're going to make us proud of a lot of success in the next few years. With all of that, just to say goodbye, I hope this was interesting, the information I provided, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer from Sevilla, from Seville. Thank you, Professor Calero. So we'll start with a set of questions in the room. If someone has a question to the speakers, Professor Zapat and Carrero, we have a question. Hello, good morning. I'm Maria, I'm president of rehabilitation in Puerto Rico Hospital. My question was for Dr. Calero. I'd like to ask, you've mentioned that the stand use of uh, contraceptive means that there's less reactive strength. In what is structures or is there a relationship probably of progesterone and estrogen? What is structure to the effect for reactivity to be less? In the last Congress we participated was a presentation I liked. And a girl who was working on the medical service of Barcelona Football Club, and to all women who were having contraceptives, they perform a number of uh, strength tests. And there was variability on their behavior having taken contraceptive and uh, after. And they show that they decreased, although it was less, between 4 and 5 percent. It was assessed in those. They have an incremental jump test with reception and uh, automated. And they assess that the reactive strength at the beginning, the maximum strength, basically on the structure on the lower part, usually decreased because of contraceptive. I included as something that is interesting to know. And if you want, I can send you the link of the article that was presented in the Congress. Any further questions in the room? We have two young people in the back. First, thank you, Dr. Jose Maria Abad, for your presentation. It's quite interesting for me to hear about the hand that great unknown, at least in one of the regions that we don't give a consider as relevant as the knee in the sports world. And it's very important for me. When we were seen yesterday in the Champions match Courtois after he stopped and he was moving the hand, the hand, the hand, and I was saying, OK, so probably if it was the knee, uh, commentators will mention be attention happened with the knee this is an important injury but the hand nobody mentioned anything it was kind of uh, I noticed so it's quite interesting and Dr. Thomas Clara pleasure as well to hear your presentation and maybe on that big challenge that for me is to invest on female world as professional and to know how we are tackling and we are helping these players a question that I would like to ask as there's a big difference in injuries of uh, male and female sports people, in your experience, has, is there a difference of um, treating them in the pits and the emergency situations that may happen both in uh, male and female football? Are there differences when um, uh, tackling one of those situations on male football and female football? Well, uh, something urgent is something urgent, and you don't know when that's going to happen. Therefore, 
and you've expressed that quite uh, beautifully in your presentation about what's origin and what's important, not just to take the material, but to know how to use it. Probably, I cannot compare on the amount of time. On the 28th years, on the first team in Betis, of course, I found uh, dramatic situations, life and death, and situations where we have to transport urgently on five uh, situations that were a bit dramatic. You know, unfortunately, and women I did not find that, but the only thing I found with them in a more important way was uh, cranio craniocephalic trauma. They, I had some uh, women who were uh, lost their senses, even in a quarter head, but, but as they are a bit less um, aggressive, urgency may be more for the male than female, but women may also have cardiological pathology and uh, um, stroke or subit death as men can have. And usually at the contact level, we would pay more attention when there is head trauma in women as compared with men. Thank you for your clarification. Any further questions in the room? Nobody? So if everything's clear, we'll give you a break so you can get some glucose for your brain. We're going to take a, we're going to say goodbye to someone. We'll be back at 3.15. Thank you. So in one hour.
Buenas tardes a todos, eh, gracias de nuevo por estar aquí. Continuamos con, con las jornadas internacionales de los profesionales eh, expertos en la lesión deportiva. Esta mañana hemos tenido la oportunidad de tener aquí a grandes profesionales, hemos tenido la oportunidad de tener al jefe de los servicios médicos del Betis, a, a un gran asesor en la traumatología del deporte en este país, eh, hemos tenido la oportunidad de tener a uno de nuestros grandes investigadores en fisioterapia y podología, eh, además de un presente, o sea que hemos tenido la suerte de, de tener grandes conversaciones y, y charlas muy interesantes, gracias a todos por las preguntas y las participaciones, así que os animamos a que sigáis participando de la misma forma, ya que esto es para todos nosotros y, y que se nos haga divertido a todos. Eh, este comienzo de la tarde es un momento también muy especial, lo digo en primera persona, pero también gracias a todo el equipo que tenemos detrás eh, cuando organizamos estas jornadas. Una de las partes importantes de estas jornadas es que eh, participemos todos y por eso ahora en primera línea tenemos la oportunidad de tener con nosotros a estudiantes del Máster Universitario de Fisioterapia Deportiva y también a estudiantes del doble grado en Fisioterapia y, y Ciencias de la Actividad Física y el Deporte. Eh, para mí es un privilegio, es algo que yo ya lo he repetido, sobre todo a estos estudiantes que son del grado y que todavía no tienen su título para ser profesionales, para mí ayudan y the, saben ayudar a muchos de nuestros estudiantes. Degree to be professionals who help a lot of our patients o or sports people on the same line as professionals as my case who have been working for over 20 years can do it with them. And uh, that's the way I feel it. And that's the way you're going to see the evidence with this big uh, end of uh, degree papers that they're going to present. You're also going to see how on this sports physiotherapy masters, all those people who are interested in participating, I always say one very important thing, is an intense year. An intense year is because there's a professional pathway that where we try to be educated, trained and be expert on prevention, diagnosis and preventing sports injuries because of all the theoretical and practical um, content and the practice we do. But it's also an intense year because there's a research pathway and the students also perform some research, many of them in an experimental format, as they will present in a minute. And I believe it's very interesting. It's so close to research, so close to the uh, experimental study, that we want to thank all the students from the Masters, and especially Jose and Antonia, who represent them with their end of master paper. So to thank their contribution to the society, which is a bit more serious, a bit more landed, and that uh, you uh, pay attention to see the quality because of the effort they have. So without further ado, I give you Jose Rodriguez and Antonia Mello, who together with Dr. David Rodriguez, as we were able to enjoy this morning, prepared a paper from the end of the master, which is going to be about the effectiveness of a neuromuscular proprioceptive program 
arm as compared with the eccentric exercise plus electrostimulation on the acute form of the dorsal flexion from the ankle. I would like to thank Sergio and Diego for being here. It's a huge challenge for us, so thank you. Let's start with our study. As Sergio mentioned, we are going to compare the neuromuscular pressure receptive with the eccentric with electrostimulation regarding dorsal flexion of ankle in amateur paddle players. As an introduction, as you know, paddle is a sport that has been growing exponentially throughout time and specifically in Spain we have nearly six million players and you can see in the graph from 2012 to 2021 the license of paddle players from the Spanish Federation grew up to 96,000 people so that's a lot and that's why it drew our attention on these sports as part of our study and it's one of the sports that is more played in this country not to say that it's the second largest Regarding injuries, okay, let me get back to it. Regarding injuries, I'm going to follow the main sports. This has 4.89% of injuries, being 52.2% injuries on the lower part of the body on amateur paddle players. We have to say that the most common system to get injuries is intrinsic, mainly because of an uh, overload injury. Usually, it's at the end of the sports practice. The system for uh, muscular flexibility, proprioceptive flexibility, we know that it stimulates proprioceptors and generates and encourages movement on neuromuscular mechanisms. There are a number of techniques. We use contraction of antagonic ones. On the eccentric movement, we know it has a very good adaptation of neuromuscular, even better than the concentric isometric. And there's a lot of literature, of literature and is based on the eccentric exercise. We have better answers. And not just stimulation is a technique that is also being used quite properly because it stimulates in involuntary contractions on the peripheral nerves and others, which makes that we can depolarize more type 2 fibers, that is the quick ones. Regarding methods, our study is a random clinical test, a pilot one, because there were not a lot of research on paddle, that's why it's interesting, and it was approved by the Ethos Committee from the European University of Madrid, and follows all the criteria from the Helsinki Declaration, in general, inclusion criteria were male paddle players over 18 years old who were amateur. And the exclusive criteria in general are musculoskeletic uh, background, neurological um, backgrounds that have an injury or under physiotherapy or something that could alter results. Regarding the flow charts, initially we had 27 participants, seven would have to be excluded because we could not find them. And from the 20, we made them run in two groups, the neuromuscular group and the eccentric one with electrostimulation. Fortunately, we had no loss of them, so we were able to monitor them and include all of them in the final result. Regarding intervention, we had a five-minute warm-up, which includes articular mobility, joint mobility, pluviometry, to apply the initial test that were three of them, well period in test that we're going to explain in a minute, lateral step down, and vertical jump, specifically the drop jump. There was an intervention depending on the group for each of the subjects, and immediately it was measured, all three initial assessments. Regarding weight very long steps that you may know it's when you push the wall where the subject has to maintain contact on the knee on the leg on the right leg without losing neutrality of the ankle and without pulling up the heel and we can measure that with the inclinometer and see the measure. Then lateral step down would we ask the subject to go with the ankle, touch the floor three times and go back up to be able to measure the angle that in this case was interesting which was the knee one. We had measured that and we measured it with the up. And then the drop jump, which is just to follow from the step and have a maximum vertical jump three times and we got the best one. And this was measured with my jump to up. Therefore, it was easily reproduced because it was not like that. We got an FNP intervention. It was the same as in the initial test of the very long test, but here we ask 
a stretching for 25 seconds and afterwards we ask the contraction of the antagonist that is dorsal flexors for five seconds it was repeated four times two minutes total and the eccentric plus electrostimulation exercise base was based on Alfredson modified protocol so three series of 15 drops in eccentric that should last for three seconds with a metronome of the 40 bpm it was used in electric current b electric electric in symmetric of 100, 100 hertz and 200 microseconds in a 10-10 cycle. Alex will measure the same, 50 times 15, and they will place two centimeters below the origin of castellans on their respective muscular van part. Regarding the statistical analysis, we use the software SPSS version 29. The tests done were the Sapiro will test, t-test, two factors ANOVA and a square eta to have the, to see the effect considering values of 0.01 for low effect, 0.06 for moderate effect and 0.14 for high effect. We also use correlation tests from Pearson. Regarding the biodemographic features of the groups, we cannot see the statistical significance and differences among them, therefore we are talking about a homogeneous sample. Regarding the results on the figure one, you may appreciate the variation on the rates of dorsiflexion regarding the ankle. We can also see that in both of them there were a statistical difference that was significant. On figure two, you can appreciate the variation that was from the knee angle measured by the lateral step down, although there was not a significant significant uh, difference from the statistical point of view, there was a variation which could be explained due to the effect uh, size, because except drug plus electrostimulation, the effect was moderate for this variable. Also, there was a high one for dorsiflexion and a, a low one for the strength one. Neuromuscular proprioceptive facilitation had a high effect for ROM dorsiflexion, moderate for in, uh, strength for uh, the step down. Regarding correlations, we may see that eccentric group had a negative correlation as compared with the strength index and contact time as compared with the NFP group. But the last one, we have to add two extra correlations. A strength index with a drop uh, height and with uh, flight time, both of them were positive. For uh, debate purposes, this is the first randomized clinical test that wants to measure the effect of eccentric exercise with electrostimulation on amateur panel players. Our finding was in correlation with what is found in literature because Moreno Press in their study says that when applying eccentric exercise on football players, they improve both acutely and chronically the range of ankle dorsiflexion. And this is an important variable because when it is changed, it may have excessive pronation. What Wyndham says in its study is that this is a risk factor to have injuries in the lower members in sports people. Now, regarding electrostimulation, Maciuletti mentions that a training program regarding electrostimulation from three to six weeks may help to improve dorsiflexion brains from the ankle, isometric strength and explosive strength. Regarding neuromuscular facilitation, proprioceptive, the proprioceptive one, the effects on an acute part are not clear in literature. There are authors like David who mention that if it could improve, it would be an effective way to improve dorsiflexion range for the ankle. 
but they may lose the performance regarding test as vertical jump. But Kyla, in uh, her study, mentioned that although this is true, it may lose performance in some tests and it may be benefiting others like sub-maximum exercise like uh, running because it improves the length of the step. Possible biases of the study would be that the tool used for measurement were not considered to be gold standards. Therefore, in future research, it's recommended to use the strength platforms and extra stimulation of high range. Second, the population was only amateur me, uh, men paddle players, so you cannot extrapolate results to other populations. As a conclusion, we may say that both techniques improve ankle dorsiflexion range on an acute way, and as future projections, it would be interesting to uh, specify how this would work in women, the chronic effect, and to see the possibility of being included on a injury prevention program to study effects in elite participants and a combined program. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia and Jose. Paddle is indeed a social sport, as you've mentioned, an emerging one, like running years ago, and now it's one of those sports where society easily includes it, and where I launch that need of a research as you proposed, because probably in those spirits with more social in, uh, immersion or is as um, intense as running parallel, of course, uh, Football 7 probably is one of them. People, lots of them, play sports to get into shape, rather to be to have fun, but they don't get uh, in shape to play this sport, and therefore we have tons of injuries that we see in our practices. So, study this, research this, so we can prove society that some risk factors may generate injuries, as you proposed. Thank you. We continue the table now with the great privilege of having here um, the presence of Oriana and on the other side of the screen with Maria. Thank you both of you for that uh, important paper, which is quite interesting and innovative. So we really looking forward for you to tell us this interesting thing you're going to talk about. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Maria, and together with my colleague Oriana Natalie, we are going to present our design of experimental study called Effects of Virtual Reality in comparison with the core work on chronic lumbar pain in female tennis players. First, we would like to thank Sergio and our tutor, uh, Jose Angel, for giving us the opportunity of being here today in this conference from the European University. To start the design of the study, we would like to mention something, which is that 38% of uh, tennis players would have to be absent from a competition due to chronic pain. After being informed about it, both Rena and myself were starting gathering information regarding the courses and different therapies that exist with scientific evidence to work on this pathology among them core work. Also, we were based on virtual reality work because it's right now pushing and we believe we could have evidence on this pathology of lumbar pain. Having said that, we're going to explain the script which is going to have with an introduction and then a set of questions if anyone has any questions. To start, to mention that we believe that we need to deal with pain on a multidimensional point of view, and well, then we will 
limited to inner specific lumbar pain, which is the one we're going to base the whole project. This pain is defined as a pain that cannot be recognized within a specific pathology. There is a subgroup of patients which solve their pain spontaneously or with weekly treatment. Nevertheless, there's another percentage that ends up uh, developing higher comorbidities like so psychosocial or muscle skeletic uh, trans disorders. And this is chronic lumbar pain, which is based on a specific things, which is age, physical condition, amount of training or psychosocial factors. Next slide, please. Regarding physiopathology, there are two models that explain the cause or the development of this disease. On the one side, we have the load model, which is based on mechanical risk factors, as may be uh, loads, sport loads of, or postures, which can produce an overload on this uh, column that will develop lumbar pain. While on the other side, we have the motor control model based on secondary alterations to the pain, which are influenced by psychological factors like stress and anxiety, and may in produce neuromuscular uh, disorders like maladaptive uh, treatment. Regarding epidemiology, quite briefly to say that prevalence is high in teenagers and it's similar to the one in adult people. Chronic pain in adults is related to a beginning of that pain while a teenager, when uh, 15 years old, high incidence of this pathology of chronic lumbar pain on teenage tennis players is based on a sonar on internal rotation of the lower member that is the non-dominant one, meaning that, and this is also together with uh, asymmetries in both semi bodies because one of the parts is dominant. Finally, to finish with the justification, where we are going to base a number of points that we consider were really interesting for the development or the creation of our end of uh, degree paper. Context is really important. How as an influencer of the sensorial impulse, so the patient will perceive pain. In that sense, it's really important virtual reality as therapy because it will provide the opportunity for the patient to have an immersion in a different reality than the deceased one. On the other side, lumbar pain is based on high prevalence being the second cause of visits to the physician in Spain. Lumbar pain in sports, specifically regarding tennis, was their choice because, as we've mentioned before, there are big absenteeism in competition and also the 35% of tennis players mentioned that they had chronic lumbar pain. And finally, to finish, we the subjects are just female because there's low representation of women on sport science. Having said that, I give the floor to my colleague Oriana, who's going to continue with the presentation. Good afternoon. I am going to continue with the design of the study regarding the hypothesis of the study would be that a protoc combined protocol A combined protocol of virtual reality together with core is going to have better results than an isolated one of just core. All of this will be on teen female teenage tennis players on the mid and long term with chronic lumbar pain. Regarding the main goal of this study, it would be to verify the hypothesis. We want to study if uh, really the uh, combined protocol of virtual reality is going to have better resource than an isolated protocol of core on these uh, female players with chronic lumbar pain in the mid and long term. Before going into secondary goals, we would like to emphasize the population of the study. At the end of the day, it's going to be teenage female with a chronic lumbar pain 
who play tennis. Regarding secondary goals, we want to assess pain intensity markers comparing both protocols. On the one side, the combined protocol of virtual reality plus core, and on the other side, the isolated protocol of core, seeing if our hypothesis is fulfilled or not. Also, we would like to study avoiding fear, functionality, and muscle activity. We want to study days in the mid and the long term. Regarding methodology, it's an experimental uh, study. It will be a randomized clinical test. We have a sample of 88 female players who were selected going through some criteria and also inclusion and exclusion criteria. Once the athletes have been recruited, this randomly through a program called Osman will be divided into two groups. On the one side, we have group A, and on the other side, we have group B. Group A will have a combined protocol of virtual reality plus score, and group B will just perform a isolated core protocol. Regarding the protocol, it will last for four weeks and it will be broken down into three sessions per week of 45 and 75 minutes. It's going to be assessed at the beginning and the end of each week and to assess that we're going to measure variables. We want to measure intensity of pain, avoidance to fear, functionality and muscular activation. In order to do so, we're going to use different kinds of tests, questionnaires and electromyography. On the one side, we have Group A, who is going to perform Virtual Reality Protocol Plus Core, which will be based on 30 minutes of virtual reality, based on visualizing a video where tennis players, female tennis player, and will move the area. On the other side, there will be the core session, which will last for 45 minutes, and it will be divided on three parts. One part will be warm-up, an aerobic one, then we'll go to the main part, where there will be a progressive exercises starting with abdominal activation, and then we will go to add movement on the uh, limbs, and then ball on stability planes. On the other side, we will finish going back to calm for uh, 15, 5 minutes, and Group B will have the same session as Group A, but in this case, without a 30-minute virtual reality session. Once the uh, four weeks are up, the tennis players will no longer be following the protocol, but they will be contacted again after 8 and 24 weeks. That is something we want to do to check whether the effects, the benefits uh, of using virtual reality uh, are indeed maintained in the medium and long term. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to take them. Thank you. Oriana Maria, thank you very, very much. Interesting proposal, interesting study. We are now colleagues, I would argue, whether or not you uh, already have your uh, BA diploma. Thank you very much for shifting the focus on the issue of artificial intelligence. That's something we didn't talk about here today, but I do think that this type of technology will have a huge impact in the world of sports. Um, I don't actually know if this person, Javi Guerra, a good friend of mine, is currently is already watching this event. Um, at any rate, I'd like to encourage you to watch his uh, intervention later on today. He's already applied artificial intelligence protocols to elite basketball um, athlete management. It's going to be very interesting. So thank you very much for talking about artificial intelligence. And thank you especially for uh, investing, um, in a way, uh, your time and resources uh, in um, the wider context of teenage uh, female athletes. I have worked with a number of uh, 
Young people, very, very talented young people. They're very enthusiastic. And I do know that we need to invest more in them. In the past few years, I'm happy to report that more investments were made in uh, young girls who are strongly committed to, to sports. And uh, we often uh, find ourselves wondering well, how many 14, 15 year old girls uh, tear their ACLs and what can we do about it? And another common injury in young girls is lower back injuries. Again, we're investing very, very little in research in this regard, but it's uh, one of the main reasons why these young athletes come to see us. So thank you. Globally speaking, I would say your study touched upon a number of very interesting points. So thank you for your proposal and study once again. And uh, let's carry on at this uh, point to conclude this uh, round uh, table, at least the presentations of this round table. We have Anna and Dani here with us. Thank you very much for coming. They'll be telling us a little bit about their proposal about neuromodulation, non-invasive neuromodulation of the vagal uh, nerve. It's a very interesting topic which can have important repercussions uh, on a number of fields, uh, recovery, training, performance, etc. Good evening. First of all, I'd like to thank Sergio and the European University for giving us the opportunity to be here. Thank you all very much for listening to us. Daniel Ortega and myself will be telling you a little bit about a part of our end of um, year dissertation in physical therapy. Our research question was, is non-invasive neuromodulation of the vagus nerve effective? Does it improve recovery in between training sessions um, using uh, CRV? So to start off, let's talk about the vagus nerve and the autonomous nervous system, which is in charge of involuntary functions such as respiration, digestion, uh, um, the cardiac rhythm or uh, stress responses. It's the longest nerve, the vagus nerve, it goes uh, down until the colon and it's in charge of regulating uh, heartbeat, uh, pressure, uh, diameter of respiratory vessels and even feeding. 8% of the fibers of this nerve transmit information about the status of internal organs and carry this information to the central nervous system. The remaining 20% is efferent fibers originating out of out of the encephalus and they uh, have parasympathetic control of the gut now variability of the cardiac frequency hrv is the variation in time intervals between heartbeats this is uh, measured in the QRS complex uh, by means of an EKG. HRV is a very useful indicator to evaluate cardiovascular risk in a number of different populations that we'll see later. And variability in HRV is interesting because heartbeat can be altered by stress, age, physical activity, etc. A number of factors, all in all. Can you hear me? Yes. HRV in sports is a very important marker to evaluate an athlete's recovery capacity and training potential. It varies de depending on the type of training that is uh, done, and it depends on the state of fitness and the individual recovery capacity of the given athlete. It can be measured in a number of ways. EKG is one of them. But lately, we can even use our mobile phones and certain apps to run tests and uh, measure our HRV. So it's easy to measure, but it's difficult to interpret because it's based on a number of parameters. HRV values are analyzed as a function of time and uh, frequency, RMSSD and HF in particular have an effect on the parasympathetic uh, system. HF 
actually acts on both the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. The ratio between low and high frequency allows us to ascertain if uh, either system is dominant over the other. It varies depending on activity intensity, uh, and it's a sign of fatigue. If it's prolonged, it can lead to overtraining and increase the, the risk of injury. So a few years now, new models have been uh, proposed that are strongly based on HIV analysis. They're called day-to-day -day models. It leads to a greater parasympathetic activation, up to 48 hours, and it affects uh, recovery. Uh, and it makes it more difficult for an athlete to achieve their goals, and that's why we have to find uh, better strategies to achieve full recovery in a shorter time span. And in doing that, we thought, why not stimulate the vagus nerve? The vagus nerve, if electrically stimulated, can help us modulate cardiac function. Particularly, we focused our study on manipulating the vagus nerve through the ear, um, where the auricular branch of the vagus nerve can be found. Specifically, this uh, branch of the nerve can be found here, as you can see on screen, and stimulation. Uh, is uh, achieved using the device you can see on screen. It's a VNS device with, an, with a little electrode that's placed on the ear. Scientific evidence, according to these study, tells us that this therapy on healthy subjects leads to significant improvement uh, in HRV and muscle response. Uh, these athletes were young. We have two articles which discusses similar benefits for older people in terms of lower depression, better life expectancy, and a lot more. This is a number of articles which uh, back these results on the impact of HIV manipulation on depression. So it's good for depression, uh, and it's good for patients affe uh, affected by epilepsy and uh, dystonia as well. For these reasons, we believe that our model would be interesting to adopt. If we can apply uh, this model to a number of athletes, we can improve the quality of their sleep, we can help them recover faster, it would be great. Also, there is a bit of a lack of scientific evidence of the effectiveness of this particular uh, therapy in sports. We have an article on intracranial stimulation um, with positive effects on athletes. And uh, we have another study on uh, recovery in basketball players, but little else. So we need more evidence. Evidence also suggests that by stimulating the vagus nerve, we can achieve an anti-inflammatory effect throughout the body. And so this could be used to act on interleukin-6, for example, to further shorten recovery time and reduce inflammation. New massive neuromodulation devices have been appearing lately, like the NESA device, and these devices have allowed us uh, to uh, carry out a study like ours. For all of these reasons, we've decided to propose this study. Our hypothesis is, is non-invasive neuromodulation of the vagus nerve applied after training capable of improving HRV in uh, athletes, um, uh, track runners? So this is the hypothesis and this is the goal. We want to conduct a study over, or over a period of five days. The secondary goal is to verify whether this type of treatment has improvements on cardiac frequency variability, quality of sleep and RP. Now, regarding subjects and groups, we'd like to work with athletes from the Spanish Royal Federation of uh, Track Runners in Valencia, 65 uh, uh, track runners under 
uh, 20 and over 20 years of age. We would establish our own selection criteria, thus narrowing them down to 56 athletes in total. We would like to rule out, for example, athletes who were injured no longer than one month before the study begins or uh, underage athletes. Once we have our group of 56 athletes, we would split the group into two uh, groups of 28 athletes each. This would be completely random. Uh, the experimental group, Group A, would receive the non-invasive neuromodulation of the vagus nerve, and Group B, the control group, a simulation of this neuromodulation. Neuromodulation would be done on the uh, inner ear in the left ear of the athletes in this experimental group and the placebo, in the placebo group the neuromodulation would be done in the earlobe so we would evaluate uh, training loads and as ind independent uh, variable hrv uh, quality of sleep and as dependable dependent variants uh, quality of sleep age and gender the neuromodulation will be done using specific electrodes and the device we showed you earlier it will be either located depending on the group in the inner area or uh, by the earlobe with the uh, specifics that you can see on um, screen regarding cycles and duration, etc. Intensity will be individual, however, will be going from 0 0.2 uh, microamperes to up to 0 0.5 microamperes up until they can feel a little bit of tingling. It won't be painful uh, for 10 minutes altogether. HRV will be measured using an uh, a polar wristband and analyzed using the Cubios app. All subjects will be monitored 15 minutes prior to receiving the modulation and five minutes after the modulation. On the first and fifth day of training, there will only be one training session. In days two, three, and four, there will be two training sessions. So we'll uh, do as many neuromodulations as there are training sessions in a day. One, days one and five. Two, days two, three and four. Every morning, athletes will be asked to fill in a questionnaire, which we'll use to um, m appraise the quality of their sleep. Then we'll monitor their HRV. We'll discuss with them subjective perception of effort and we'll apply the non-invasive neuromodulation and once again we will uh, measure HRV and this is how the study would work that's all from me thank you very much for listening we're now uh, more than happy to take your questions if there are any thank you Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. New generations uh, are eager to make an impact. I love the connection you made between nervous system and sports. I think the investment you are requesting here can lead to unlimited positive results. After more than 20 years working in, in high performance sports, the vast majority of society seems to believe that physical therapists only do uh, massages, uh, stretching, bandages, and we do do that, but we do much, much more. We act on the nervous system, as you just showed us. Recently, we treated a Spanish Federation athlete from the under-23 selection. Um, 
using intracranial manipulation for a heel injury and the pain uh, seemed to disappear and she was able to play uh, the game she was scheduled uh, to play eventually so thank you thank you thank you so much this is very very important it's something we really need to uh, look at and to study what i don't like as much is well uh, the study is going to take time <laughs> obviously and i I wish, I wish I could get your results tomorrow, basically. The next few weeks are going to be rife with training sessions and uh, match days in June and July. And I only wish I could use neuromodulation on our athletes to help them recover, help them train, help them perform. Uh, to the best of their abilities. Uh, so please, please uh, uh, do your study as soon as you can. Thank you, truly. Uh, I'd like to encourage our audience at this point to ask as many questions as they can, because this is the right time to do so. Hello. My question is for Daniel. You mentioned uh, a model called day-to-day -day model. What is it? The day-to-day -day model is a planning model. Which focuses not only on external loads that athletes will have to bear. It also takes into account internal loads and stress on the nervous uh, system, depending on the intensity of the various training sessions. So if an athlete gets a good HIV uh, reading uh, two days in a row, and then the following day the HIV value is negative, it means that the athlete needs to rest. Um, this is what it is, pretty much. Of course, these models need to be highly customized to the individual athlete, and they need to be applied uh, uh, daily, uh, which can be time-consuming, of course, for coaches, but they're highly effective. Are there any more questions? I'd like to thank all of these uh, uh, lovely students for participating in this. I have a question for Antonia, Jose, Maria, Oriana. Have you taken into account, um, let's say, the level of um, your athletes? Uh, will they be amateur athletes, professional athletes? In the case of Pado, uh, well, I'm from Chile. Uh, and it works a little different uh, in, in uh, paddle the uh, categories go from one to seven and from six onwards um, people are regarded as being professional so we wanted to work with people amateurs uh, ranked from one to five according to the professional uh, categorization of paddle here in spain athletes one to five so amateurs the uh, most common injury mechanism was intrinsic for, due to muscular overload, uh, which drastically changed uh, in professional players. So yes, I do think that, the, let's say, the uh, uh, level of uh, players would have an impact on the results. Yes, it's something we took into account as well. One of the inclusion criteria was that athletes would train between four to six hours a week. It's not the same to train two hours a, day, uh, a week uh, and six hours a week. Another inclusion criterion that we didn't mention is that we wanted these uh, tennis players f to come from the high performance school. 
of the European University. Thank you. And in the study regarding the vagus nerve, uh, will you take variables such as stress into account? Because that could affect the results of your study. If two athletes, uh, same level, let's say both pros or both amateurs, if one of them is stressed, that could lead to some variation. Have you thought about that? Yes, of course, there will be plenty of factors uh, affecting uh, the variability of cardiac frequency. And this would in turn affect the results of our study. Uh, but one of the reasons why we want to uh, uh, use our feedback on a quality of sleep is precisely this. Certain athletes perform better or worse depending on how well they've slept. So that's all I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sí. Are there any more questions? Yes. So you talked about lower back injuries, guys. I'm not a tennis player, but I'm an amateur paddle player. And I often get injured in that area in my lower back. What can I do to prevent those injuries? I do warm up, but what more could I do in my day-to-day -day life to strengthen the area? Okay work on your uh, stabilizing muscles <laughs> on your core and don't forget virtual reality um, what about warming up and stretching yes before each session it is good to warm up don't stretch when you're cold but yes do warm up your muscles okay thank you. are there any more questions about paddle, I think you said that most injuries seem to occur towards the end of a match. Do you think that could be due to the fact that amateurs don't seem to warm up as much as pros? And is that a kind of injury that you see as often in pros? Okay. What we've seen is this. I should tell you that one of the things we want to see if the, our study could be useful in terms of warm-up. If electro-stimulation leads to results, we want to see if that can lead to problems over the following 24 hours, because in the moment it didn't. Um, if it doesn't, then it could be used when warming up, modulating uh, the intensity, of course. Uh, electro-stimulation actually can be used for, an, for a number of things. Uh, quick fiber, which is what we looked at, slow fiber to improve resistance, and uh, intermediate types of fiber. So if results are good, yes, this could also be used when warming up. Um, proprioceptive uh, uh, neuromuscular uh, stimulation can be a little more complex. There are electrostimulators that aren't very expensive that could be used in this regard. But yes, if our study confirms it, then we do believe that uh, it, this could have an effect uh, for warm-ups. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Good evening. Thank you for your presentations. I have a doubt regarding uh, one of the presentations, actually. I was hoping you could clarify it. When it comes to using virtual reality for tennis players, what do you do so that uh, athletes can visualize their performance and improve their performance? And I know this study was focused on girls, but I was wondering if maybe similar studies uh, have been done in other fields or if the same technology has been used by professionals, for example, here at the Madrid Open. Thank you for your question. Yes, virtual reality is a technique that hasn't been uh, studied at large um, yet. That's why we wanted to study it ourselves. Uh, we want it to be innovative. Can you repeat your question, though? 
What do athletes see when they put their goggles on? Okay, in our case, we'll be using a program, a piece of software that already exists because we're not software developers. It will be a video of an empty room with objects in it, and we'll ask them to pick up objects off the floor or off a shelf, for example. It's been shown that nociceptors for pain when acting in a virtual reality environment do not stimulate the brain, which means that our tennis players will be performing movements that uh, they'd be scared to perform outside of virtual reality. And because they're in virtual reality, they won't feel any pain, which means that subconsciously they'll be making movements that they wouldn't otherwise make. Okay, I'm going to weigh in here because I've been following a study conducted by Javi Guerra. Uh, and I encourage you to read it. Also ask Javi uh, your question, if you like. Uh, virtual reality is, uh, has basically just arrived in the world of sports and uh, it is now time to find out whether it is effective or not. Um, and it's possible, uh, it could be effective. That's the hypothesis of this particular study. Of course, in order to be able to use it, you need to be quite knowledgeable about computing and programming. Uh, we aren't necessarily, we're physical therapists, which means we would have to work hand in hand with people who'd be capable of um, programming, a, I don't want to call it a video game, but a scenario perhaps, a scenario in which athletes can move and um, put certain parts of their body to work, the lower back area, for example, uh, and so on and so forth. So. There are huge untapped opportunities here, and that's exactly why this uh, study is really worth conducting. Are there any more questions? I have another question, uh, just occurred to me. This is for my physical therapist colleagues who are working on the vagus nerve. We know that the autonomous nervous system throughout the day, depending on what time it is, uh, sometimes the uh, sympathetic system is generally more active during the day and the parasympathetic system is more active at night. Is that something you'll be taking into account when measuring HRV? Are you going to be collecting data on rest days as well? Thank you for your question. Very, very interesting. Thank you. In our protocol, we'll always be taking a baseline measurement for the HIV, so before a training session, after a training session, before neuromodulation and after neuromodulation. So four takes. And uh, yes, we'll take into account the increase in parasympathetic activity after training. Um, and the increase in parasympathetic activity after stimulation. Uh, so yes, that's something we've taken into account. Any further questions? Any online questions? Any questions at all? Yep, we have a question. Didn't see you there. Wonderful presentation, thank you. So for the people on the vagal nerve, I would like to know how you're going to bear in mind sensitivity of the patient. It's truth. How are you going to apply that at the ear level? Not all patients have the same sensitivity. If they don't have sensitivity, are they going to be as an exclusion criteria or how are you going to do that? Thank you. First, the intensity of the current is going to be individualized 
each time together with uh, the location, the parameter that is going to change amongst them. So it's going to begin, as I've mentioned before, if I remember, in 0.02 milliampers, and then it will be increased depending on the feeling of the subject. Therefore, they will always feel some tickling, more or less, but it could never be painful. So after 0.02 milliampers, it will increase until the subject says so. Thank you. If there is no sensitivity, it would be an exclusion criteria. Okay. No, we have no more time for more questions. So, one final question. One final question. Sorry, just one final question. Quickly, from Mexico, they're asking. There's a question about virtual reality. What are the graphs that you're projecting? and the effects that uh, the very virtual reality is looking for, and I answer for it, I give you some context, the graphs they want, we already have them with a question from our colleague before. This is a program designed by engineers and uh, software engineers, the one showing those scenarios that we don't decide or choose and the main effects that you want with virtual reality is, as I've mentioned before, what we are looking for is because one of the effects of chronic pain at the end of the day is avoidance by because of fear. So we want in an unconscious way, in conscious way to move that part and strengthen it. Okay. Thank you. Maria, Ariana, Ana, Dani, Antonia, Jose, Tons of thanks. Thanks for being so brave. I know it's not as easy to be up here. You did great. You generated a lot of interest. There are lots of questions, meaning that there's a lot of interest. So it makes a lot of sense what you've mentioned and what you're going to propose. I know that you're not going to stop here, but I'm going to ask anyway. Don't stop here because we need you in those big proposals we are having all those big investments that you are proposing and I foresee a great future for you and I encourage anyone who needs a big professional like you guys are proven today to be to pick up the phone get the social media or whatever you do nowadays but get in contact with you immediately because the level you've proven it's huge so thank you thank you and big applause for you all. thank you
Hola, la moderadora, ¿me, me escuchas? Hello, the moderator, can you hear me? Bueno, buenas tardes de nuevo. Ok, good afternoon again. Buenas tardes de nuevo. Vamos a continuar. Good afternoon again. We are going to continue with the next round table where we're going to talk about chronic pain. And for that, we want to thank Agupun, first of all, who were a sponsor in this table. As you know, Agupun is in charge of being provider of needle for electropunction and all our seminars and projects that we have on the 
master and the INNOVA award, non-invasive, they are in charge of providing the materials. So we want to thank them. And uh, let's see the video. So thank you Agupun for this sponsorship. And now we can start with the round table that as you know has different uh, three big experts. The first one is going to be Alejandro Duque. Luque. As you know he's the manager of the physiotherapy area of the Malaga University also. He's a professor over there. And as you know he was top seven in tackling chronic pain and it has a lot of reference in all talks, conferences, presentations and other events that he's been having through his social media and different communication areas and uh, he was uh, nice enough to give us a bit of his afternoon to focus a bit on this tackling of chronic pain and he will be the one telling us about so we really want to hear from you and I give you the floor okay I think it's my turn of the presentation in English so if you don't say uh, the Opposite. My name is Alejandro Luque. I'm from the south of Spain. Um, uh, thank, first of all, thanks uh, Universidad Europea de Madrid for having me here. It's a pleasure being here and sharing my time with you, even though the presentation is going to be very, very quick, briefly. It's a short presentation, 15 minutes presentation, but I'm happy to, to share my knowledge here. Uh, please, can I see my first slide? Sí. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. But this is my, my presentation, my first slide. So. The, the, the title of my presentation is Chronic Pain in Sports, some notes. In, the, in this short period of time, I would like to, to emphasize uh, in some specific aspects of, of the study of pain and to try to, to send some small messages to, to all the audience. Okay, so go ahead next. Okay, thanks. So uh, it's very common and typical to hear in sports that no pain is no gain if you don't feel pain, you won't win, you won't gain, which is a great method in order to increase your effort to achieve your goals, which is great. But on the other hand, it's not the best message to, from time to time, manage your pain, because it's not a question that you have to suffer pain. And even though if you suffer pain, you have to go ahead in the world of the sport, which is a great message, as I told you before, to improve your performance, but not maybe to deal with your pain. Next, please. So um, another typical comment in, in sports, in athletes, for instance, like the pain is nothing compared to what it feels like to stop playing or playing with pain is normal. Uh, it's very common in elite, in, in elite athletes, it's very common to hear this kind of uh, statements and expressions, but I would like to point out in the process of my presentation, sometimes it's not, it's not the best way to, to manage your, your pain. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, we are going to transfer knowledge in this presentation from pain sciences to sport sciences. This way is bi-directional, so sometimes we learn from the sport sciences, we incorporate it to the normal people, but in these slides we will see some knowledge coming from pain sciences and try to apply this knowledge to sport sciences. Next, please. Okay, sorry, because this uh, headline is written in Spanish, but what I'm trying to say is that many athletes, the time they leave the, the, the sport or the competition, they continue, they still continue feeling pain. 
which is good to consider because athletes are not another type of person free of pain. They, they suffer pain during their, their uh, career. After career, there are many of them continue feeling pain. Next, please. So, we don't have many data about the prevalence of pain in sport. We got a lot of data about the prevalence of pain in the normal world. In sport, we don't have many data. So, this is a, a field that has to improve. Okay? Uh, there is one interesting study coming from Beach Ball, uh, the, the, the World Championship, saying two important things. One of them is the the, the, the two rows highlighted in yellow. The first one is that between 25 and 50 percent of the athletes playing beach volleyball in the highest competition suffer pain from the last two months. Which is more clean is that they didn't miss any day, any training day. Which means that even though, please, the previous one. Thank you. The most important message is many of them are playing with pain, but none of them are missing competitions and are missing training, which means that they are playing with pain. Okay, next please. Okay, another specific, uh, some, some notes. The first one, athletes with low back pain present responses of resistance to pain and not avoidant responses, which is in the general population. It is that the low pain with re resilience, with resistance to pain, uh, in opposition with the normal people with show uh, avoidance behaviors. The second one is after retirement, Alejandro, many athletes Alejandro. suffer from Pain. Alejandro, creo que estamos teniendo un poco de problemas para poder escucharte bien. Estamos intentando estabilizarlo, pero parece que no es posible. Entonces, eh, ¿podemos probar a desactivar tu webcam? A ver si al consumir menos datos podemos tener una mejor conexión y por lo menos podemos seguir la, eh, la explicación de una manera un poquito más correcta. Porque es que es verdad que se te interrumpe demasiado y prácticamente no estamos pudiendo seguirte. So you're getting um, okay. And now, can you hear me much better? Que podéis oírme mejor? No, más o menos sigue igual. Hola. Sí. Um, hola, hola. Nada, igual. Nada, igual. Estamos igual. Vale, si, si queréis... Um... Podemos, eh, eso es, vamos a, si os parece bien, vamos a pasar al segundo ponente de la mesa, mientras intentamos, eh, mientras los técnicos intentan contactar con Alejandro y poder pues reparar ese sonido e intentar que, que pueda coger una cobertura un poquito más limpia y así de esta forma pues, pues podemos seguir porque yo creo que es muy interesante la, la participación de Alejandro y sería una pena pues que por un pequeño problema técnico pues no podamos aprovechar al máximo eh, bueno, vamos a ir buscando la presentación en este so caso we're going to get the presentation de, de, from uh, la de Diego vale tenemos esta es la, Diego, la siguiente tenemos que poner la siguiente which is the next ¿vale? one y vamos a pasar como decíamos vamos a pasar and we are going to de esta go mesa, que to conocéis. the bueno, next pues speaker aquí, that as you es, know Diego Miñambres. It's a Diego Miñambres. Pueden restaurar un segundito. Let's see if they can restore that. Ahí lo tenemos ya. Venga, perfecto. Pues ahora ya tenemos. There we have it. Tenemos la presentación de Diego bien cargada. So now we have Diego's presentation loaded. While we saw this technical glitch, so it's a pleasure. Many of you know him. Diego is the director of training of Innova, also the usual professor from the European University in the physiotherapy and many seminars from the University of Master in the Real Madrid School. He is also a professor, a researcher. The, he has some very interesting papers, and today he's here to talk on this chronic pain area, talking about therapeutic processes to modulate pain. And as usual, Diego, a pleasure to hear you, and really looking forward to it. So you have four. 
So, thank you. I was going to say thanks to the organization, but it's like, like thanks to me. But thank you to the university because of the advice, Mr. Nielsen, who every year is here with us. I don't know, well, luckily or unfortunately, but another year, thank you for the very good job that you perform. So I come here to give a bit of a talk that maybe is an introduction of Dr. Luke and Javi Kebra. So what I come here for is, I don't know if it's to present, but to remind you of these procedures based on uh, pain descending process. Maybe the purpose of the talk or the presentation is to remind you how it works so we don't lose sight of it. Dr. Lucas started his presentation saying the transition from science to sports itself half a long way ahead, especially on that contextual part of the sport, and especially because of the athlete. Sergio was saying at the beginning of the talk that what we do most is to provide messages and bandages. But the whole perception of handling of chronic pain, as you know, it's changing. And again, about the talk from Alejandro Luque, the uh, athlete retires, but not the chronic pain. And there are more and more athletes that have pain after they retire. This very week, there was information from the observatory from the College University of Chronic Pain. And they were already talking, uh, saying that at the national level, over 25% of the population has chronic pain, where just 40% of the population visits the physiotherapist. We always talk about integral tackling of the patient, approach of the patient, where psychology, more nutrition, have a relevant aspect. But in this observatory, for instance, it does not appear that those clinical entities have been consulted by patients with chronic pain. Therefore, we still have a long way ahead, in spite of the fact that the ones who are here today know that multidisciplinary work that is needed for that approach. There's a lot of work to be done, especially at the education level with the patient. And education level, not as a theoretical education, but as a education of understanding in the pain and needed to approach it by different professionals. From that perspective, as I was saying, you already know this uh, definition of pain, which I'm not going to say, that unpleasant emotion associated or not to a damage of tissue, and that by definition, that experience is always a unipersonal, individual experience, is usually together with a biological, psychological, or social factor on which I emphasize we talk so much about it to the patients and which we really don't do that properly. From that pain and nociception, uh, these are different uh, events. And pain is not just provoked by neurons. It's not just that sense activity. There are other parameters that need to be assessed. Of course, pain is an experience. And as such, the patients are going to live it like that under some expectations, under a given context. Professor Guerrero this morning was talking about it. We are a complex dynamic system, a changing one that needs to be adapting to information that is arriving. From that point of view, what do we use the brain? The brain is a filter, a screen that makes information to be relevant and that we are aware of it. Within that process of being aware of information, the role of uh, the brain is prediction. And that prediction is adjusted based on the previous experience. Worst case scenario for a brain is uh, the worst thing for a brain is uncertainty, not to know what's going on or why that is happening. Therefore, for the brain to have the ability to adjust that decision making process uh, means that the patient may go into a chronic pain. At the end of the day, it's a threat. As you see here, the brain is an open life adaptive system that wants, of course, survival and adapting to the mean. What do we also have in the brain? It manages things as somatosensor, emotional, past memories, of course, culture. Our colleague from Turkey was asking about it, if the culture was important. Of it, it is not, says the speaker. What in European cultures may seem normal, in Asian cultures or others may be difficult to understand and that may create a conflict on understanding the patient. Uh, remember that thoughts are also nerve impulses, and as such, they're going to have the ability to generate change 
on the cortex. Chronic pain is just an assessment problem, a disadjustment between expectation, uncertainty, and what's happening. By definition, pain is an alarm system. It's an anticipatory signal that tries to avoid a larger problem. What is happening with many of the long-term processes of persistent pain that that alarm gets stuck, gets stays on, and in a normal period of uh, scarring that should finish also the information to the brain. In those situations, the alarm does not stop and the information keeps on being there. Therefore, when the system is activated, it doesn't just activate this pain system, but also the immune endocrine Vegeta vegetative uh, nervous system also activate, and they generate an unbalance on the tissue homeostasis, which provokes the uh, persistence of symptoms. This pain, this alarm, generates a call to action. We need for the brain to start doing things to know what's happening. Therefore, pain may come from tissues and initial alarm signal, but when it's persistent, uh, a persistent alarm is because of the central nervous system that keeps that alarm. At the end of the day, in this paper that appeared last year, that generated a lot of noise from the scientist's point of view, includes us how pain could be that unpleasant uh, purpose, but it's not just the biopsychosocial environment of the patient, of the athlete, but also how that patient relates with its environment and how it finds as threatening or no threatening in the context in that situation, in that moment. As I was mentioned, people, culture, and a number of non-biological elements may create a scaffolding to favor or have a pain experience being persistent, and that neurocentric theory that we always assume that pain is on the brain, we have to be cautious about because there are reactions that could be outside of the brain that may have symptoms persist. Nevertheless, all of this is interrelated, and we have to bear in mind we're talking on the first table in the morning to know the environment of our athlete without being their friends, and that's going to give us an important uncomporting for empathy to create that bond and that confidence with the patient, and from that to create an entry point in the pathology. From that moment, as uh, information modulation systems, these are key points of this nociceptive system, and we know that on some chronic pathologies, they change that this sending inhibition, which is the natural system we have intrinsic that would help us to favor those uh, analgesia mechanisms. These two are us. The two we have there. From the dorsal horn, we have the first synapsis, which is information that we got from the periphery, and it's gathered in this dorsal horn of the spine medial, getting information from uh, the one and two blades from the Lissauer part, and then we activate interneurons that will be the ones that are going to design if this information that I got from the periphery is relevant enough as to send into higher centers or we design that is not relevant enough and they stay there. What happens in long-term processes that that interneuron is aselective, is hypersensitive, and any information coming from the periphery has no criteria to select it and then decides that everything needs to go up because everything is important. As descending ways, we say from the cephalo that it is not the ascending or descending uh, managing of the interneuron, but from the brain cortex, it has that modulation through uh, superior centers. This is the brain, periodontal brain matter.
the RVM on the magnum nucleus. Why is it important that uh, periductal brain matter? It's really important because, and we've mentioned that, about the importance of emotions, the stress, and the periaqueductal brain matter is very connected with the hypothalamus associated with stress, with the amygdala, and also with the limbic system, the emotional system. Are the other related one designing something is painful or not? It's going to be the limbic system. Further to get information from the spinothalamic. Uh, way in a direct a way, the nociceptive entry. Very important also on the conductor level because this periaqueductal brain matter may be an important activity of fiber C uh, regarding survival to preserve information from delta fibers, which are the ones that are most relevant regarding adaptation of the uh, body in the middle and long term. The second importance here, any negative uh, uh, impulse goes from the spinal bulbar area and it gets there. And from that point onwards, from that information that is expressed to the somatosensorial cortex, it's going to decide whether it's generated or not that painful experience or not in order to, like, like a loudspeaker through the on and off cells, the spinal bulb is going to increase that, the medulla oblongata, so it's going to either decrease or decrease that noise or that pain, so it's lower or higher. And finally, regarding the brain matter, since descending fibers to get into place 1, 2, and 5 from Brexit. And when we get there, it's a serotonin uh, emulsion that will produce glutamate and to produce that. How can we act as physiotherapists? With that perspective, what we got is a reconceptualization a cognitive restructuring from pain. We should understand that it could be pain without tissue alteration or that that tissue alteration could be solved. And therefore, we have to understand that the tissue alteration is not going to be on the previously injured tissue, but in the higher centers of the brain. Therefore, that alteration of modulation descending systems that are present in chronic pain is going to make that, that pain information continues on the patient. Therefore, we have to tackle the brain and not just the structure. And pay attention because I'm, I'm mentioning both of them, not one or the other. I emphasize that beliefs on the patient and the cultural approach on the patient is key. Theoretic adherence and bond are essential. We're talking about that we have to touch the limbic system, hypothalamus. We usually say that what doesn't emotionate, that what doesn't excite you, doesn't heal. Because of that emotional management from the patient's perspective of pain is going to be difficult to tackle pain in the long term, the persistent pain. From here, that reconceptualization or cognitive restructuring is going to be based on learn share by understanding by the patients of pain or biology, meaning that this could be provided a masterclass to the patient or getting little by little closer to the patient with these more uh, concepts. To understand the patient in a wider context allow us to know the cultural level and therefore to be able to adapt the message that we can provide. Most of these muscular skeletal persistent pains of no traumatic origin, we know that have no patronomic relevant diagnosis that explain that experience, uh, painful experience and disability. It's also true that we talk about in a specific pain, but I would like to invite you to think about that concept when we talk about in a specific lumbar in a specific pain, cervical in a specific pain. We know that in both cases it's about 80-85%. And I would like to call to clinical reasoning. I don't want us to become lazy and love that expression, because at the end of the day, when we accept the word in a specific, we end up by 
have been lazy about the diagnosis, and it seems that in a specific seems that everything goes, that oh, it does it doesn't matter because I can do whatever I want because it's in a specific. I cannot. Although a pain is in a specific, the reasoning of the clinician seems to be a priority one in tackling our patients. No matter how specific it is, we have tests to assess uh, joints, ligaments, muscles, fascia, and the whole of that information is going to provide some treatment, apart, of course, from knowing the weight of uh, central and peripheral uh, sensitivization. So the word in a specific should be something to encourage, to want to find more information. And I say this with love and the coordination of invasive therapy from the masters. When I say non-specific, eventually I end up doing dry pricking. That's it. Right? I don't know what else to do. I just do that, dry pricking. But then dry pricking doesn't work or other techniques don't seem to work. But they do work. You just need to apply them at the right time. Mulligan, McDonald, all of those techniques, they're not, they're not about doing things just because. They're about doing the right thing at the right time. And this is the same in this case. It's the same in this case. So, with these alterations come kinesiophobia, fear, and there is often an alteration in uh, uh, concentration skills. They uh, struggle to understand the information they, we provide them with. If there are movement alterations, then we probably need to find a different uh, treatment tool to sort of remap brain pathways uh, before even the athlete um, or the patient rather uh, starts to, uh, to, to to move to do exercises and recover finally almost finally actually from the point of view of physical therapy what techniques could we use you know them all uh, virtual reality, uh, mirror therapy, gradual uh, uh, motor imaging, uh, physical activity, of course, uh, exercise-induced hypoalgesia, that's something we have a lot of evidence for, uh, benefits on strength, strength. Training has a beautiful impact on analgesia, analgesia, uh, fatigue, uh, exercises, isometric contractions as well. There's no perfect recipe. Uh, fitness is one thing, but uh, exercise that's done to induce recovery is a different matter, you know that. And then we have the placebo-nocebo effect and uh, the power of our own words. That's the neuroscience of pain. Uh, whatever we say is going to either empower or uh, undermine our patients. The placebo effect plays an important role. Let's not underestimate it. What is that? It's something that we highly welcome. Very often, uh, we do know that, for example, one given technique works, but we don't know why it works. That's placebo. And it's great for you. To summarize, treatment should be customized, tailor-made for each patient, for each day, for each situation. Professor Guerrero said so at the beginning of... Um, uh, today's event, especially in uh, elite sports, which means we need to know the context in which the person operates and to communicate effectively. We need to be effective when we communicate. Physical therapy is a negotiation. I'm going to give you what I think you need and you're going to do what you think is good for you. That's how it works. 
multidisciplinary interventions, uh, so physical activity, psychological treatment, nutrition, self-management is something we have to encourage, which would mean a person's capacity to function properly, whether or not they're in pain, and that's fundamental in order to uh, avoid phenomena such as movement limitations and kinesiophobia. Take a Take into account what expectations your patient uh, has and their uh, medical history as well. Provide your patient with your patient with education and information about the process, as well as treatment options, um, integrated movement patterns, sleep, food, stress control. We uh, often talk in our profession about silence. Uh, training. That's what I'm talking about. In rehabilitation, recovery, physical therapy, um, we know this. We can treat tissues, but if then a patient uh, doesn't manage stress well, doesn't sleep, doesn't eat well, then it was all for nothing. It's five pillars, right? And that is why we need uh, a multidisciplinary team. So, use an active approach, as I always say, an active approach both in designing exercises and working with our patients. Manual therapy, man manual treatments can be used as a complement. It's complementary to everything else we do. It's manual uh, treatment plus therapeutic indications. In this case, one plus one equals three, not two. But the combination of these two things is highly, highly beneficial. That's all. Thank you. We currently cannot hear anything um, in the English booth. There we go. We'll be uh, continuing with Alejandro now, and then we'll get back to Diego's uh, topic, which was very really interesting. Alejandro is now available, it would seem. Uh, Alejandro, can you hear us? Very well. Do you have your presentation? I'm going to turn off my screen. Yes, we can see you, we can hear you. Um, over to you, Alejandro. You have the floor. Can I see my slides? Can I see a big screen, please? My slides? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I can, I can yes, see that. I can, I can see, see that. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, my apologies again. So, it was easy to. It, uh, it's going to be very easy to continue because, Diego, you did a great job. It's much easier to, to continue my, my presentation, my slides, after your, your brilliant presentation because you touch many interesting points in the management of uh, pain in general and chronic pain in particular. So, uh, I will go faster right now and try to, to be focused on one specific single slide, okay? Next, please. Uh, next, please. Uh, next, because I think it was a bad, a bad sound in the next one. Yes, yeah, sure. Stop here, please. So, what I'm trying to say in this slide is the prevalence of pain in sports is it's very high, even though the quality of the studies are not uh, very good and the, the number of the studies are scarce in the liter literature, uh, we've got some data saying that many athletes suffer pain, many athletes compete with pain, and many athletes don't miss any training day or any competition day instead of pain. This is the, the most important message from this slide. Next, please. Okay. And uh, three key points 
The first one is that athletes can show or, or present resistant behaviors when they suffer pain, but in the opposite, normal people present avoidance behaviors, which is a great difference. The second one is after retirement, many athletes suffer pain, suffer depression, not only when they are practicing their sports, but also when they retired. And third one is a very important one, the use of words, the power of words. It seems that like in normal population, the, the power of words that you use in front of your athletes, it's quite important to manage to control their pain. Next, please. Okay, I have to, I have to provide a definition of pain, which is very, uh, at some point, very difficult because uh, pain is too complex. And I used to say that the best definition of pain is the definition that the person has, okay? But coming from the, the International Association from the uh, Study of Pain, we can define pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with, the, one of the key points in this definition is the, the emotional experience. It's not a sensory experience, but also an emotional experience that one person feel, feels when, when he's in pain, okay? And the other key point of the definition is that it can be an associated with actual or potential tissue damage, which is very well related to the idea that Diego said that pain is not only in the tissue, okay? So this is the, the two key points of the definition coming from IASP. Next, please. Uh, a small picture, uh, and Diego explained that very well, but in order to show that basically there are two different systems when we are talking about pain. One of them is the ascending nociceptive uh, pathways. Well, exactly, there are two. Uh, taking the definition by Melsac, there are two ascending nociceptive pathways coming from the dorsal horn, and there is a one descending pain inhibited system. And I would like to emphasize your attention in the dorsal horn. All the information coming from nociceptors is not pain information. So nociceptors are not pain receptors. Pain is something more complex that is processed in central nervous system, in higher systems and it's not a question of nociceptors and the, um, the, 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 the situation in the dorsal horn, which means that nociception, as Diego said, is not the same as pain. And uh, one, one moment more, uh, all the information coming from nociception has to stop in different levels, including obviously the brain in different parts of the brain, the different part, uh, parts of the brain, and then it seems that pain can happen or not, and uh, the good point is we've got a powerful descending pain syst inhibited system that can work many times okay, but in many athletes don't work properly. Next, please. So, a slide that tells you that pain is more than one or two single factors. For instance, this slide is about low back pain and all the factors influencing the experience of pain in one person. It's not an athlete, this piece of work, but you can translate this knowledge to, to sports. Which means that if you put the focus only, for instance, in individual factors, in psychological factors, or in biomechanical factors, you are losing part of the story. So, if pain is influenced by a lot of factors, please consider all these factors. Okay, next, please. So, and this is another key point. Sports-related injury is not the same as sports-related pain. Pain is not the same as injury. Injury is one thing, it's a clinical suspicion of damage 
to body structures. It's a possible tissue damage, for instance, when you sprain your ankle, you are practicing basketball and you sprain your ankle and you suffer pain with a lot of inflammation. This is a sports injury. And for instance, when you feel, as Diego said, a specific pain, for instance, low back pain without any specific uh, cause, identify cause, we can call it sports-related pain. And the treatment, the good point and the key point is the treatment is, and the approach is absolutely different. So another key point is injury is not the same as uh, pain is a sport. So please consider that. Next, please. So I'm coming from the previous slide. Injury without pain may happen. And pain without injury without a tissue injury may be possible. And this is very well known, and there are very good papers from coming from the last two or three years, good statements with guidelines saying that please consider that. Next. Uh, another good point is uh, the medication in athletes. So if you see the graph, the, 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 all this data, it seems that athletes uh, have nutritional and um, vitamin products with around 50% of the, the global intake, but they have analgesic, non-steroid analgesic uh, pills around 30%, which means that uh, a lot of athletes uh, have pills to relieve pain. So pain is very important, obviously, in athletes. Next, please. And the famous biopsychosocial model of pain, that it seems that all of us follow this model, but in real, I think none all of us are following the biopsychosocial model. So you perfectly know the bio dimension, the psycho dimension, the social dimension, and I would like to point out the context around the interaction between the three dimensions around the interaction between the, the physical, the psychological, and the social factors, and the importance of the, of the context that I will show you later on. Please, next. Uh, I'm happy to share one project with my colleague, the next speaker, Javi Guerra, Mark Flores. They carry out a beautiful project about uh, trying to implement pain neuroscience education in elite basketball players. So we are talking, talking a lot of days, a lot of years about pain neuroscience education, about that you have to improve the knowledge in pain in your patients, in your athletes, but how? How can we do that? So we did that last year. Uh, if you see the infography at your left of the, of the screen, and we use an infography in elite basketball players try to teach them about pain science. And we got it. We got preliminary results saying that a single pain neuroscience education intervention, just only one day, 15 minutes, uh, pain neuroscience education improved their knowledge in pain, pain science, which means that if you provide knowledge to athletes, you can try to push them in a right way. It's not only the only thing that you can do with your athletes from a psychological point of view or providing information is not the only step that you have to take to improve the comprehension of pain uh, for your athletes. But it's just like a drop of water in a, in a big uh, ocean. And we did the, this study and the results are, are coming soon. Okay, so next, please. And uh, very, very quickly, the most of the approaches right now uh, to relieve pain in a science uh, have low evidence. All that you can imagine, surgery, uh, infiltrations, next one, next, please. Uh, like platelet, platelet rich plasma in Achilles tendinopathy, or next, please, many physiotherapy approaches 
have low evidence, but don't worry about it. It's going to happen in the next future. Why? Because pain is complex. It's multifactorial. And if you try to, 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 to manage pain just with only one single view, one single approach, you will find low evidence. So don't worry about that because, because of the multifactorial character of pain. Okay, and uh, one another. Uh, sorry, the next one. Another comment about this uh, slide is another good point right now is try to explain why the techniques work using another theoretical model. So we cannot explain that manual therapy work works because of you are moving a vertebra because it's not like this. Or because, or why kinesiotaping works? Because it moves the liquids, the all the, the blood, the circulation. This is not well aligned with the new science. So please try to provide to your athlete good explanations based on the science about why your technique works or not. Next, please. This is a beautiful slide that most of you uh very well known that i love this this picture this uh, this study about the importance of the context for instance at this case in all the text techniques and approaches that you can imagine in the management of osteoarthritis the blue part is the amount the percentage of the effect that can be attributable to the context to the placebo effects. And if you see all the approaches like uh, pills, medication, acupuncture, magnetic fields, paracetamol, etc., most of them, the real value of their effects are based on the context around the intervention. I'm not saying that the specific part of every single technique doesn't matter. I'm not saying that. This is the red part but you have to consider that the blue part is the most important one. So please consider to create a good context in your interventions. Next one, please. So finally, in a very short presentation, key points, chronic persistent pain is very common in the sports field. Second one, pain and injury are not synonyms. The third one, findings in pain sciences have not been yet uh, have not have yet uh, have not been yet transferred to sports sciences the fourth one due to the complexity of pain it's very difficult for a single therapeutic approach to have a strong evidence so don't worry about it uh, the previous last mechanisms of actions of many procedures are different than those thought in the past and avoid nocivo messages in your athletes. So next, please. So finally, maybe we will we have to change the name of biopsychosocial model and try to propose a new social psycho contextual biomedical model of pain. So my second advice is try to live with un uncertainty. And my final advice would be try to live in a gray scale nothing nothing is black and white okay nothing i can i cannot say this is the best approach to manage pain so yes go ahead or this approach doesn't work so try to be from my humble point of view try to be in, try to be in the middle okay next one so i'm very happy to be here for the discussion part happy to receive all your questions not sure in spanish or in english it doesn't matter and thanks a lot for having me here thank you Ahora, bueno. Thank you, thank you very much, Alejandro. This was very, very interesting. 
Uh, Alejandro talked about the importance of adopting a multifactorial uh, approach. Our third speaker is uh, now here with us. Um, and I think his presentation is going to serve as a bit of a wrap up of everything we've, we've said about treatment, about pain, perception. Uh, we're talking about Javier Guerra. Javier Guerra has been working with elite basketball athletes for over five years. He used to live in the Canary Islands, uh, now lives in Malaga. He has a lot of experience in a number of different disciplines. And um, he has quite a, quite a lot of experience in chronic pain management. So Javier Guerra, uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you, thank you very much, and good evening. I'd like to thank the uh, Real Madrid University School and Sergio and Alvaro for inviting me to take part in this uh, round table. If you can pull up my presentation, please, thank you very much. I'll be talking about virtual reality in um, elite athlete management. Uh, Flores and I are part of the uh, uh, R&D department uh, of a virtual reality company, uh, and we've been trying to adapt a new software, a virtual reality to chronic pain management. Uh, this is, uh, let's say, the topic of my PhD dissertation. Why virtual reality? I, I like to use this video to show people what it feels like to use virtual reality um, with athletes. Okay, to give you some context, why do we want to use um, virtual reality to treat chronic pain? This is all about neurocognition and neurocognitive training. Neurocognition is a uh, a process which can be used to improve specific neural mechanisms in uh, uh, motor behavior in athletes. So we can use virtual reality to train athletes to perform a certain action or gesture. The goal as a result is basically to train our central nervous system. I don't like to uh, call it the brain. I'd, I'd rather talk about the central nervous system because it is really a complex system. Two, train our system to perform a certain action in a um, sport context. Now, what the central nervous system does depends on the sensory motor neuromuscular behavior and the, informa and the information we receive. This is something that hasn't quite uh, been paid a lot of attention to uh, over the years, so it's a new topic we've been exploring. And so we tend to label uh, as a neurocognitive challenge all those uh, tasks, mental, visual, auditive, verbal, uh, which entail a certain degree of cognitive attention. So we basically want to catch the attention of our athletes to train <coughs> automation in the athlete. So that uh, pain can be better managed or certain movements can be practiced and better performed. 
influir más en el comportamiento. As our colleague was saying earlier, we do know that when an action is performed in virtual reality, pain is not perceived uh, with the same intensity as in real life. And so in the past few years, this is this model proposed uh, in 2021, the Trident model, has been used and applied to such uh, instances as an ACL tear, an ACL injury. This is, of course, a virtual reality model. Let's go to the next slide. In this regard, recent evidence suggests that alterations in the cognitive function uh, sensory neuroplasticity, uh, postural control, in proprioception and motor control is all associated with the emergence uh, of an injury or the risk of injury in the athlete. So if there is a strong correlation there, if our central nervous system from a motor point of view behaves differently due to a fear of pain, then action is required. There is a lot of scientific evidence on uh, the alterations that are produced in an athlete's behavior when this happens. So, RTP programs are aimed at better understanding the demands of a given sport. And I love this graph because as physical therapists what we have to do is not only improve performance the performance of our uh, tissues the tissues in our athletes we also have to improve the athlete's response to the demands of its sport and visual information in this regard is a very important element in how they behave therefore we really need to try and have in the return to play or adapt to sports. It will need to need con complex cognitive stimuli, as Diego was saying, about the predictive part of the brain. In so you in complex motor tasks similar to the ones that can be executed in the sports practice for a better ecologic validity for this return to play program. So what we need to try and do is see how do we can transfer that motor learning to future uh, performance of the athlete. And here is where virtual reality may, see, may be introduced next. Providing a bit of context on virtual reality, although it seems futuristic, there are tons of teams that are using this, and Premier League, which not just because of economic resources, but also because they have more interest on innovative aspects in handling injuries. Close to 50% of clubs from Premier League are already including virtual reality in the readaptation processes to create that contextual pressure of the match day. So kind of what a colleague was saying, to try and generate a context where which will simulate the context or environment that was real when the injury was produced so our central nervous system can adapt to the demand that will happen in the pits or the competition next. Virtual reality basically is a simulated experience with multisensorial content, which could be visual, auditive, and haptic, that is intentionally presented towards the senses of the individual. So we're going to try through the senses to sensory information to generate an experience to modulate some aspects of the athlete. In order to do so, what we've seen is what we're going to try is to recreate situations related with the sports practice so we can reproduce or provide a context on training situations, assessment of abilities or decision-making process by obtaining similar results from the physiological and psychological point of view and performance point of view. So we're going to try to do what we said before, to find a context in an ecologic way the demands that we're going to submit the athlete by respecting the basic principles of retraining of any athlete. Next.
And what we've seen is that the effects obtained when we use virtual reality as compared with the traditional exercise is that we get the same physiological effects at the uh, heart rate or uh, oxygen consumption, but decreased and perceived uh, effort and more adherence to the theoretical programs. Therefore, virtual reality will allow us to provide a functional context that would encourage within theory exercise, which we know is one of the key elements in our recovery process for athletes. For instance, this is one of the apps of virtual reality that is being sold specifically designed to create uh, sports environments to develop tactical parts created with the athlete practice. And this is a perfect example on how to introduce virtual reality within those ecological demands of this athlete. This is one of the apps that many of the teams from Premier League that I was talking about before are using as of today within their not just in the readaptation processes, but even on training process and improvement process regarding performance. Therefore, and recently we published, as Sergio was saying before, we have a paper which tries to offer a new physiological situation on why virtual reality may work on patients with chronic pain, especially the influence on the decision making of motor behavior. Therefore, we're going to try to do, as I was saying before, immersive virtual reality modulates the experience both of the environment and the body of the person with the active model Diego was talking about before, trying to modulate that dynamic interaction between the different neural networks related with motor behavior. And this is important because at the end of the day, our nervous system, what basically tries to do is to relate with the environment through our very body to answer specific threats and to fulfill the main goal, which is to preserve homeostasis. With virtual reality, we're going to try to change that information, both as we will see regarding the environment and the very body information, so we can modulate that possible response to a threat. And here, this happens following a four-step process for multisensory integration, body embodiment, motor performance, and reinforced learning. Multisensory integration through virtual reality, we're going to do is to uh, stimulate the visual cortex through the eyesight. We're going to recruit those sense modalities together with auditive information, tactile information, proprioceptive, or even with optic uh, devices that are being developed recently. What we are going to do with that information is to generate a full perception together with that extraceptive uh, information from virtual reality and interceptive information so we can generate a experience towards the person. This is going to be possible because of that dynamic integration of the different sensory uh, signals from both from the environment and the body. And that configuration of signals is what is going to allow us to generate that experience. And virtual reality is going to allow us not just to manipulate the environment, as we were saying, but also the virtual body, and it could change ranges of the uh, virtual uh, body, aspects, sense of uh, perception, sense regarding to virtual reality, which I don't have time to explain, but are very important when inducing that corporal illusion due to full body virtual reality, which could be the same or similar to the neurophysiological principles of delusion with the rubber hand that was studied quite often. Therefore, what we're going to do is going to create a modification in the sense of embodiment, which is the sense of perception had in the body, which is a sensory process called somatic perception and somatic representation, which includes the activity of different 
brain areas from the uh, central nervous system. Y lo que se ha visto es que tanto esa, and what we've eh, seen is that both that embodiment, that self-perception of the corporal image and motor uh, system, share neural networks that could be modulated through the mirror neurons described by Professor Ramachandran. Therefore, through that neural system, mirror ne neurons, we will modulate both our self-perception of the body, and as we'll see now, motor learning processes. Visual stimulation of visual avatar and that body illusion that we were talking about before in the first person, which is going to promote with that mirror neuron system, is to generate changes in sensory motor cortex. This is an application, for instance, we're developing right now with dynamics, where we are having mirror therapy in richer immersive virtual reality. That way, what we're doing is to try to stimulate those system of uh, mirror neurons. And these scientific studies would show is that when there is movement through virtual reality, uh, brain areas activate, both related with execution of the movement, in this case of the hand, and observation of the hand movements, therefore, is not just involving areas related with the very movement, but also with the mirror neuron system that we can kind of activate through observation of actions. Therefore, what we're going to do is to modulate that dynamic mapping between the body image and pre-personal part to generate the change of the experience of the subject and to change the motor behavior. In such a way that visual motor congruence between the visual avatar and the patient is going to generate a new process, learning process that is associated to activation, as we were saying before, of the main sensory motor network. And we we're going to be able to modulate answers and motor conducts associated if we're talking about patients with chronic pain associated with the perceived threat, as Diego was talking about. Or if we are talking about performance, we can talk about motor learning next. In such a way, following the basic principles for motor learning, and this a study from Guccione, which is quite interesting on optimization of movement, understanding that motor learning is going to come from interaction between the person, the environment, and the task. With virtual reality, what we can try and do is to modulate the very perception of the person, the environment, and the task. Therefore, we can use all three elements that are necessary for any motor learning uh, process to optimize the ability of movement, either from the injured athlete or patient with chronic pain, or even we could talk if there are studies, I'm not going to get into it, but there are studies to improve the ability to acquire a sports activity on training with virtual reality. So all these effects, we can see that they can go for patients with chronic pain, injured athlete, or healthy athlete. And to start finishing, virtual reality basically, which is going to provide a safe, safe context to facilitate that optimization of the motor behavior, improving those uh, recursive lobs that have on dynamic interaction from the person with its internal and external environment. Or as Diego was explaining before that relationship in active of the subject with the context with the very body and how our brain is generating the experience, is generating responses based on all that information that is getting next. And with this, I would like to thank again the Escuela Universitaria from the European University from Real Madrid, Premio Innova, and Sergio Diego to my team from the Innovation Technological and Social Innovation Church in Dolores Saluda that Alejandro is also part of. And finally, to my team from Unicaja that fortunately, uh, recently, we were able to get this title of Copa del Rey, which was really special. Thank you, and uh, I remain here in case you have any questions.
Muchas gracias, Javier. Muy interesante. Thank you, Javier. Really interesting your explanation, your presentation. Let's see if there are any questions. Someone who wants to. We have some questions. Let's see if we can have the microphone. Over here. Hello, I'm Carlos. My question is for Javi Guerra, as mentioned, the current winners of Copa del Rey and Liga has having the best season in their history. Now, I would like to know if virtual reality is something that you already use in the everyday in Unicaja, and if so, in what kind of situation and what's the feedback from players? Unfortunately, not on our everyday. On readaptation processes, we've been using it in several cases. And truth to be told, players are quite positive about it. First, it's something interesting. Second, it's fun for them. And third, it's a way to introduce some task or some elements that maybe without virtual reality would be or would have to introduce uh, further in the future for instance to introduce reaction elements on a monopodal position after an important ankle sprain or a recovery process from the anterior cruciate ligament. When you do that within the immersive virtual reality, those fears, that uh, doubt behavior that was talked about today does not happen because you're introducing a different environment where quite often you generate a sensory uncertainty, which is what we use as a strategy to modulate that model learning. In the paper we developed, that Ali is one of the authors, we talk a bit about how generating a safe environment allows not to have so much uh, activation of the network on defensive uh, answers to a threat, therefore it's no so much activation and is more activation of the default network. It would allow us to modulate experience of the corporal image that quite often we think uh, uh, proprioceptive alterations are because the mechanoreceptors receptors from the periphery are not working properly. But there are studies as of today that phenomena like is matching cortical and changes of somatosensory of some areas and on athletes happens and after a spring ankle we see that there are alterations on tactile sensitivity on joint position sensor ability so modulate that through virtual reality and the changes are surprising in many cases thank you okay are there any further questions any more questions we have over here another question and then you go with the online questions I'd like to ask Alejandro on the slide from prevalence of pain in athletes. As therapist, how do you handle if an athlete has pain and is competing with pain, as he mentioned, is that going to affect the performance at a high level? And I believe it would be like a risk factor and it could be uh, more prone to an injury. How do you manage in your experience that? Mm -hmm. Gracias. Um, Thank you. No tengo tan claro con I'm not so clear about competing with pain will lead you to be injured all the time. Allow me, if like everything, there's no certainty, there's, it's more, and I work with the sports people a lot, with athletes, and I'm seeing this from far away, Javi works with a lot of uh, athletes, and many of them compete with pain, and the idiosyncrasy of the sports leads to sometimes having to compete with pain. So I believe the key point is 
if there's no tissular um, injury that is getting worse, or if you're able to know that the loads to which you're submitting that body are not going to generate an injury, sometimes it's going to be impossible for a person not to play or not to compete without pain. It's going to be impossible. Well, we need to make the athlete understand, as I was saying on the uh, slides, is that pain is not injury. We usually handle uh, managed by asking a lot and listening to the athletes. And sometimes you get surprised because the very athlete says that there is more pain when he slept words, when he lost, when uh, uh, he has problems with his uh, significant others, when he doesn't know if he's going to renew next year. And there is pain that is not so much with the physical load. Therefore, to compete will not have to be a problem regarding pain because what is maintaining pain is all the factors that are not just biomechanical ones. Therefore, my advice is remember on the slide we saw with all factors that have an influence on the painful experience of a person. Not always, and not because it cannot be, is the tissue on load that provokes pain. Therefore, sometimes to compete with pain, I agree with you, could be partially could change the performance of an athlete. Partially, there are other ones that when they feel pain, they behave better. So absolute messages are really difficult. But to identify on whether pain from that person is ruled by a dynamic and physical factor, in that case, we need to talk, we need to manage loads, we need to reduce exposure or if the pain is because of another factor, cultural, psychological, social, emotional, and so on and so forth. In that case, you will have to make the athlete understand what we need to deal with so it will compete without pain. Okay, so we go to the end, to the questions we have online, okay. Hello, to congratulate you, Diego, Alejandro, Javi, congratulations, it's true that it's really interesting to listen to you on how the body works, how the nervous system works, pain in sports, it's true that it's quite interesting, so thank you. So we have from WITA Academy of Professional, they ask, they mention, they say that they focus the presentations on very much towards analytical work, towards the injury of the area. And they understand that that's not a sports, obviously, that globality, multidisciplinarity, the multifunctional model of the body. They understood a bit, a bit off based on what you talked about in your presentations. From my point of view, I totally understood, I understood quite the opposite. So maybe if I summarize it poorly, it's from the stimulative nervous system, we have changes on a big scale in the whole body, and globality includes that. I don't want to be the one saying that, because you're the experts. So therefore, I would like just to give you a bit of this uh, question they have and the comment you may have in that sense. If you want, I can start. We cannot hear the person who's talking. Okay, on the opposite, we talk about global multidisciplinary stimuli. Nobody talked about, I'm going to give a poor example of stimulating the medium gluteus for uh, something, quite the opposite. And if uh, the human being is complex in competition even more. So, no. Nope quite the opposite. The presentation is more to understand that human being that uh, we have as a complex neural system and to tackle the treatment with all necessary professionals for the sports for the athlete. So I really don't understand the analytical part they're talking about. So if Alejandro, Javier, you want to complete a bit more? I don't know, maybe it was in a different uh, part, maybe the question was not for this block, it's quite the opposite. 
to what I heard from my colleagues, so I apologize, but I believe it was quite the opposite. We didn't see the system partially, but we saw the whole thing, uh, complex dynamic system, multiple factors that are not always is the same thing, the same uh, factors that modulate pain, and then the next day it's going to be different ones. And the action uh, happens in all the, in not just one area, but different areas. So just to add that it's quite the opposite. Okay, I agree with Diego and Ale. I don't know if really the question was for us. I believe we all talked about the complexity of the sports person because we're talking about uh, people or they need to make it individual and they need to understand in the relationship of the athlete with the context so i really don't think we're talking about from an analytical point of view and not is that i'm saying that because i sport an elite i work on elite sports for over eight years and i totally agree with what they're saying the analytical reductionist uh, point of view of the athlete nowadays should not be the message but the opposite to understand the demand the task the context the ecological demand that I try to talk about and how the body of the athlete tries to answer from those factors that Ale was talking about, either on a recovery process or on a competition period towards the demand that are posed there. Therefore, I totally agree with the globality and I don't think the message from any of us was towards the analytical part, quite the opposite. Thank you. Okay, so maybe the question is good to emphasize the message we want to provide to talk about the person and the athlete as a complex dynamic system and to analyze the whole thing uh, when talking about it and when trying to help the athlete. That approach to ramification that we're saying that I handle quite important to differentiate pain and injury is not one the course of the other and the other way around. And it's true that we start quite well at the end with Diego providing a first theoretical approach and then Alejandro enlarged that and we finish with this final part of ritual reality which is where we towards where we're going and it's going to be it's uh, starting and it's going to be really important in the next few years so i think this has been a very round table very well done so i would like to thank you all for your presence as we were saying at the beginning it's an honor and i think that we can stop here with this session because there are no more questions i believe so we'll stop here and um, then we'll continue with the other one so good afternoon
¿Qué tal? Pues continuamos con esta última mesa de la, de la jornada de hoy. Um, mesa que, que versará sobre la, la fuerza y la lesión deportiva y el return to play. Y mesa que, que tenemos pues, la suerte de... Pues, injury de, de, and time to play, um, eh, which Nessa, is um, sponsored by Nessa World, that provides new modulation devices. As we saw in our TFG table, neuromodulation, non-invasive in this case, techniques that are more and more complementary that want to find that a small percentage that we need with that sometimes we cannot get and that with the advanced technology provided by NASA we can get video in. Estamos allí siempre por eh, tecnología de vanguardia última generación y estar mm. al día porque eh, los jugadores tienen que estar eh, en máximo nivel eh, después de cada partido. En el mundo de élite se busca el, el 100% del rendimiento del jugador. Nos ayuda mucho a nuestros deportistas, me ayuda mucho en los equipos donde he estado. El 95% no es suficiente, eh, entonces eh, ese 5% hay que buscarlo de cualquier forma. Nos gusta adaptarnos a la realidad clínica del día a día, que es cambiante y no tiene nada que ver la fisioterapia que yo hacía hace 30 años, con la hace 20, con la hace 10, y para eso tenemos que especializarnos, formarnos. Entonces, eh, la demanda de aprender, la demanda de utilizar nuevas tecnologías, de apoyarse en dispositivos como, como la NESA, es continua y es necesaria si quieres mantenerte prestando el mejor servicio posible a estos deportistas de élite. Okay, so as we were saying, let's continue. We are lucky because we have Professor Sergio Vasquez Santiago, who's a physical therapist uh, with a degree in uh, sports activity. He's the adapter in sports and he has worked for many years in basketball, especially elite and professional. And Sergio, thank you so much for being here. Sergio is also the manager of the Fonlabrada Centrum Film Madrid, and a pleasure to have you here another year as professor from the Master in uh, English, and a pleasure to have you and to listen to you. Thank you all, Sergio, Diego, and the university. In my case, as ex-student from the university, it's a pleasure to come back, let's say, home, being able to give back everything the university provided on the training years. Okay. In my case, and further to thank you, I have to thank Javi for his presentation because without having talked amongst ourselves, just to be told, it's easier for me for what we are going to talk about now. We can focus now on the practical side. So who best to talk about the most theoretical part of the cognitive or new cognitive uh, work that is being done within readaptation processes. In my case, we're gonna work, as Javi mentioned, on anterior cruciate uh, ligament injury because it's more related to your cruciate ligament, which is more related to this cognitive work. The first we would like to give you is to give some context on our function of physiotherapists, we adapters, which we are more worried about what they are going to demand from the clubs. It's the concept of availability for the uh, players to be on the most possible amount of time to be able to train and compete. Regarding that, our two big uh, concerns are usually both the hamstring injuries and the anterior cruciate ligament. The hamstring one because of the high degree of prevalence and recurrence that makes that throughout the season we have a lot of uh, time down from players, uh, both on training and competition, and regarding anterior cruciate ligament rupture because of the time 
of downtime on that sense, especially in those cases where there is a second break-in, a second rupture on the homolateral and contralateral sides after the first one. Okay, a little more context. This study dates back to 2021. It was a longitudinal study over the course of 20 season, seasons from 2001 to 2019. 68 men's football clubs, uh, high performance clubs were looked at, mostly competing uh, in the Champions League, uh, most of them. And we looked at the prevalence of ACL tears. There were a total of 118 such um, injuries. And 18% 18, 18 of those uh, players suffered a second tap in the time period of the study. So the interesting thing about the study is that there are two main factors here. Uh, these injuries occurred without any contact between players. And it's an isolated uh, injury, meaning that when the ACL ruptured, when the ACL tore, no uh, cartilage or other ligaments uh, were damaged in the knee. Okay, so isolated uh, tears. In these cases, we need to use a little bit of a more conservative approach when it comes to treatment. If we look at both these factors. So the first tear happened without any contact whatsoever with another player and uh, no re tears in these cases. A total re tear percentage goes up to 42%. So if a player suffers a tear and uh, ticks off these two boxes, uh, they're more likely to have a re tear, to suffer a re tear. And it's a relatively high percentage. Because an ACL tear means that, a, well, two ACL tears mean that one player can have up to two years downtime. Uh, and you know what that means for, for, for their careers, no salary, uh, or if the salary is still being paid, um, or the player still can't play, so. Let's talk about the motion, the mechanisms that cause ACL tears to, to, uh, to happen. There's an internal rotation that's a mechanical factor, of course, and we all know that, but let's move away from the merely biomechanical approach. Let's look at the whole context when such tears are suffered within the sport. There are three main factors, subject, task, and environment. Subject, well, that's all about understanding our athletes, how strong they are, how mobile they are, and how all of that affects the way in which they move. Second thing we need to take into account, task. That would be a tactical or technical action that athletes are called upon to perform in their sport of choice. It's something we easily see in basketball, where um, if a pivot is asked to carry the ball throughout the pitch, does so in a very, very different way uh, from all other players. Okay, And the final factor to take into account is the environment, what's going on around uh, that subject carrying out their task. How does this environment affect the way in which such task is conducted? These three factors feed off of each other. They affect one another. So in this day and age, in order for one of our athletes to successfully return to play after an injury, we have to correctly address all of these three factors. In the past few years, the focus uh, was placed 
on the subject, um, strength training, mobility training. After that, task, uh, sprints, uh, technique, which is all fine and dandy, but at, uh, at the same time, another thing we have to do is look at the context where these things occur the environment in which the athlete operates. So to illustrate all of that, I'd like to show you a case, the case of an Arsenal player. Arsenal's women's uh, football team suffered four ACL tears throughout this season. All of us who've worked for high-performance athletes know how alarming that is. Well, it's alarming enough when one first ACL tear happens. But imagine the amount of prevention programs and, and, and tailor-made programs uh, they started conducting in this club after two, three, four tears. We know that these tears are multifactorial and no matter how much prevention uh, we we do, it can be avoided 100%. In this particular case, this is a defensive um, action. The defender here is attempting to intercept her opponent, and at the very last moment, when she's about to get there, the opponent just ever so slightly touches the ball and changes directions, which means that as uh, the first player, the defender, is about to set her foot down, she realizes she needs to change uh, the direction her body is facing in space so that she can keep chasing the ball. As she does that, she gets injured, the ACL tears. And so, if you look at her movement in these images and these photographs, I would assume that this player has practiced that particular movement dozens of times in training. But the question is, how many times was this 90-degree turn made by this player, not because she wanted to, do, but as a reaction to an external element? Because if I coach, uh, set up a circuit for her and tell her, do 90 degree turns here, here, and here. That's fine. But in this particular case, she's reacting to something else that's happening. She's not the one who wants to do it. She has to react. She's being reactive. And so, at this point, Javier has already talked about this pretty much. As soon as the ACL tear happens, an immediate neurocognitive dysfunction follows, relating to afferent information that the ligament receptors provide regarding stabilization of the knee. After surgery, a gap can be, a bit of a difference can be appreciated in the capacity these receptors have to send such information. But after surgery, the brain enters a phase of neuroplasticity. At this point, we can either give our brain positive or negative instructions. And so it's very important to um, give our brain positive instructions, positive neuroplasticity, so it can better affect regrowth. Early on, the focus should be internal, and we can all agree on that, but it's something we often abuse. We ask our patients to practice in front of a mirror, to use visual feedback information to see if the knee is moving properly, if the hips um, are compensating by um, drifting off to one side. And as Javi said earlier, and in this regard, Virtual reality can provide some useful information at first. We can help our athlete, athletes move away from this internal focus and uh, adopt a bit of an external focus instead. 
del, de la contribución somatosensorial al, al control neuromuscular. With a descent in the somatosensorial contribution here, it is possible that players may become overly dependent on visual information to correctly place their knee. That needs to be avoided. And about this, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of worst case scenario. That's something we do when it comes to physical conditioning and preparation. We assume here that uh, the player will have to work with the highest load uh, possible. That's what we assume. We don't ask them with, bear, with effectively bearing those loads. It's worst case scenario planning. So we do our metrics and we make our decisions accordingly. The issue is, of course, that towards the end of the season, the competitive demand increases. We're preparing players, of course, to compete for 70, 80, 90 minutes even. But then all of a sudden, uh, a game comes along where, where most players have to go on playing for 120 minutes, which means when we plan out our training sessions, we take that into account. We know that it's possible that that might happen. And we do know that uh, if the player is not ready to withstand that load, that they, they'll, that they'll be more likely to get injured over their 120 minutes of play. This is a study conducted by Biscayne in 2022, which showed that the higher the cognitive demand, or the more, focus is placed on the task aspect in players who've already suffered an ACL tear. A tendency results whereby neuromuscular stabilization gets worse. In these types of cases, we should bear in mind that worst case scenario is not only that internal rotation mechanism that often leads to an ACL tear. We should take into account that most uh, motions are performed at very high speed um, and across different uh, direction planes. These three factors all together, high speed, um, various attention focuses and different planes of movement, increase the risk of uh, such injuries to occur. And as Javi was saying earlier, what we want to do is right now endow all adaptation rehab processes with a sort of cognitive load from the very start, very, very early on. We mentioned virtual reality earlier. Well, there's something we want to do because there will come a time when our player will have uh, to go back to working without our supervision uh, in an environment that's not as controlled as uh, uh, rehab uh, recovery procedures are. When they train group players have to take um, take a number of factors into account and uh, they need to be prepared neurocognitively for whatever demand is placed upon uh, him or her in a situation of real play which is more chaotic so we need to make sure that our players are able to stabilize their joint on their own accord in this particular case, Javi I didn't mention this earlier, the article suggests, so to speak, that th this cognitive load that I was mentioning earlier is, let's say, made up of three elements, distraction, reaction, and decision making. So very, very early on in the recovery process, 
will explain to our athlete that as they're performing a squat, for example, uh, they should, uh, I don't know, look around, uh, try and make some calculations, basically perform more than one task at the same time so that they can get used to dealing with Mul uh, multiple uh, stimulations at the same time. It's all interconnected, uh, uh, as you can see. This is the chaos continuum model, the control chaos continuum that was published a few years back. This is more geared towards, let's say, the physical part of training, obviously, but in re-adaptation processes, the cognitive part, we need to make sure that the player is little by little uh, accompanied by us from a situation where they have complete control to another which is play, basically, match day, where, uh, well, there's chaos, lots of external stimuli. So to conclude, it's important to understand that in these types of cases, the work that has been uh, being done is good from a structural point of view, that we need to keep on working along those lines, and in fact, we need to uh, insert an element of cognitive load training in our rehab processes so as to better prepare our athletes to face up to the demands they will be um, tasked with uh, dealing with once they get back to play. Thank you, Sergio, for your presentation and thank you so much. If we're talking both about science and clinical practice, which is very important. Let's continue now with our next uh, speaker, Eugenio Buza. Eugenio is a physical therapist and a specialist in uh, high performance. Um, sports. As you can see, he's at home here. He works with uh, the, uh, the women's first um, team here at Real Madrid. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, Eugenio. You've already taken part in our events before in the past. And as I always say, thank you very, very much for finding the time and your very busy schedule to be here with us and share your knowledge like Sergio just did. And thank you also for adopting such a great approach, uh, uh, whereby you'll be talking to us about both what you see in your day-to-day -day life and uh, science. Uh, prevention strategies we all know are particularly necessary in women's football, so thank you for coming here to talk to us about it. You have the floor. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this round table. It's a pleasure to end a work day uh, on such a high note. Thank you, Diego and Sergio, for the invitation. I'll be delivering my speech in English. Let's begin. Okay, so uh, the, thank you so much for, for having me here. Today we'll be talking about the iliotibial pain in the female athletes. It's, it's a pleasure to share with you some, some of the knowledge that I gained in the last three years working with the female athletes and uh, especially with female football players. Um, it's something that uh, some details that I maybe wasn't very uh, aware of when when I was a student or when I was working in, in male football, and I hope you you'll enjoy uh, you'll enjoy the talk. So let's start. Today we'll be talking about we'll start talking about epidemiology. What are the numbers saying, the statistics uh, about the iliotibial pain in, in, the, in female athletes in general? But most of the examples will be about uh, football players because this is my day-to-day uh, -day reality about the risk factors for developing this 
this dysfunction or syndrome, call it whatever you want, about the functional anatomy. Uh, I think there will be some uh, interesting insights to, to share the etiology, the injury mechanisms, and the screening that we as specialists uh, must be aware of and uh, some rehab ideas that we implement in, in our staff when dealing with this uh, with this kind of syndrome. Next. So what does science says, uh, say? Um, it's pretty similar to, to the runners, uh, athlete. Um, most of the overuse, yes, it's part of the overuse dysfunction, the ITV main pain like uh, femoral patellar pain, the tibial medial strength syndrome, the Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, most of them we see predominantly in, in female athletes, for example, the, fem the femoral patellar pain, the tibial medial stress syndrome, less uh, in females and more in males, we see the Achilles tendinopathy and the ITB pain. It's something uh, maybe less common, uh, to, to know about, but for me, when starting to, to read the, the literature about this, which was quite weird, because when we think about maybe ACL, as my previous colleague talked about a lot, ACL, mechanics, hormones, females, athletes, it would be more uh, natural to think that in, in female, we have more ITB pain, but it's in, uh, in males that develop more this uh, dysfunction. What about the, the knee injuries? So uh, the ITB band uh, pain is two thirds of the total knee injuries in runners. As I said previously, males develop it more than, uh, than females. Uh, and within females more predominantly uh, with uh, femoral patellar pain and, and dysfunction. Okay, so let's start talking about the anatomy. It's it's quite easy. We, we all know that uh, uh, proximity attached uh, to the iliac crest. I like particularly this image in order to see the anterior border of the fascia lata with with the tensor of the fascia lata and posteriorly with the glute, superiorly with the iliac crest. And it's important to mention here that it doesn't attach. To the to the glute meat and to the glute medium. Afterwards, it, it's in almost all its length of the femur. It attaches to the linea aspera, uh, and it's strongly attached. And this is an important aspect to mention, as you will see earlier. And afterwards, it detaches almost in the uh, distal third of the femur more or less about five centimeters superior to the lateral epicondyle. And afterwards, it inserts distally and the anterior aspect of the tibia, the called um, the famous Georges tubercle. So now, let's see now more in details in the, in the next slide. Okay, so uh, approximately to my right, uh, you can see that I just to see that the biggest abductor and the strongest one is the glute maximum. And this is the, the strongest uh, frontal uh, stabilizer of the hip. Even we know that it's the glute meat, but you see that the moment arm uh, from the hip joint is, is much bigger. Afterwards, to my left, I inserted this image in order for you to see that in what I mentioned earlier, that in the last third of the femur, it, uh, detaches and in the below image uh, in the right circle you can see uh, a uh, yellow substance that appears there and this is the uh, the the fat tissue the adipose tissue that we know that has really uh, uh, important uh, nociceptive messenger for 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 the pain development right uh, and there, in this space, it's where it starts to, to detach. And afterwards, it attaches also into the knees fascia and reinforces the, the patella in the external border. So like this, it develops 
as a strong stabilizer for uh, medial patellar dislocation, mo mostly that occur after uh, after a hit or lateral blow in in this part of the knee, and you see the strong attachment in uh, in the tibia that you mentioned earlier, the the, the Jordis tubicle. Let's go on. So the thanks, what we have to think about the as the from the entire fascia lateral with all this aspect from proximal to distal that. Uh, we can consider it as a, as a really as a, a tendon because it stores almost 14 of the 14 percent of the energy that occurs uh, dur during uh, running. That's it's almost half of the Achilles tendon. So we know that, for example, when we talk about Achilles tendon, it stores or the force that it produces from the ground. It's uh, sometimes if you talk about the gastrocnemius, it's about four times the body weight, eight. Uh, to six times for the, for the soleus, so it's it's a pretty important structure. And besides uh, uh, besides giving a lot of uh, lateral stability to the knee and during mostly in various moments, it's also it's an important medial patella dislocation. But most of function that it develops in this part lateral part of the hip is the is the 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 SEA mechanism the what is they say in spin in Spanish as the ciclo acortamiento estiramiento so the storage and release of energy that occurs during continuous motion motion is, uh, is its main function. Okay, so now you can see here uh, a dynamic uh, photo uh, that uh, of, of a runner. And what you can see here is uh, the distally, the, the fascia, it gets more prominent as the knee flexes. So this tension translates gradually from the anterior border, you see it, to the posterior border as the knee, as the knee bends. So where is it more prominent? About 30 degrees of, of knee flexion that we know that when we evaluate our, our screen, our athletes there, where they develop uh, most most symptoms. You can see in, in this to the right in this MRI uh, functional uh, image in T2. In the first two images, the knee is in extension, and in the second one below, the knee is in flexion. So if you compare, for example, the A the uh, image A with image D, you can see that uh, uh, the IT band moves medially as the knee as the knee contracts in 30 degrees of, of flexion and in white it's the adipose tissue that gets compressed mostly in the, in these degrees why why this information is relevant is because we always learned uh, and read from papers and books that the ITB band is a, a friction syndrome but even from the uh, anatomical point of view, what is seen earlier, and I mentioned that it's not possible because the ITB band is uh, attached to the linear aspera, so it's mechanically impossible to get friction to the lateral uh, epicondyle of the femur and get uh, like this an uh, anti-inflammatory and inflammatory response. So it's more about a compression syndrome that occurs in the lateral aspect of the knee. And maybe the, the now what the, the main hypothesis is this gets a compression of the of the of the fat. And this is the most uh, dominant uh, nociceptive uh, stimulus for uh, for the nervous system in order to respond with with pain. Okay, so when does this IT band gets uh, get loaded? More it's in downhill running, so in eccentric, eccentric motion, on uneven surfaces, uh, during hip extension and knee flexion. You'll see that this is uh, a test that from uh, this will uh, we have a, a screening test where the deathless test uh, positive and in various moments because if you think. Uh, walking, uh, uh, walking or running downhill, it's where the, the lateral aspect of this will get in a various motion. So the lead leg through uh, continuous pulling 
of the of the of the fascia in this part, and afterwards we'll see where it gets uh, symptomatic. Uh, is compressing the the fat, and the uphill running with the concentric uh, energy or the concentric type of contraction is superior to the to the eccentric one. You can see in the graph uh, below that the uh, the loads of the knee are much more or less from for about 76 percent if you see in a in a, in a five percent decline so this is one of the good strategies to implement in the in the acute phases okay what about treating the, the fascia i think the, uh, many physios or uh, rehab coaches would uh, implement uh, rolling or treating manually you know the, the fascia and it's quite quite uh, painful so that's why i i consider it interesting to talk uh, about this so what they saw in 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 this study that for increased compliance and uh, as we know the compliance is the property of the of the tissue to deform more it decreases the capacity of the whole uh, posterior lateral fascia of the of the, the hip uh, to uh, resist uh, virus torques and diminish like this the uh, stretch and shortening uh, cycle. So there were also mm, seen no differences between patients with and without ITP band condition uh on uh on the eco images and also the stiffness of the of the whole fascia increased after six weeks of rehab so it's important to data and it's important data to consider when implementing uh our treatments okay when screening in the orange one this is the primary painful zone that we will usually find in in our athletes and if we would do uh, when screening a triangle between the gergis tubercle the, uh, and the fibular head and the lateral epicondyle, it will be on the superior part of uh, of this triangle and palpate there. So we'll execute uh, passively from a knee flexion position, moving towards extension at about 30 degrees of knee flexion. It will be where usually the 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 patient the athlete we will complain for for test um, usually what i would tell you in my uh, what have the cases i've seen in, in in my work that if i see this test positive i'm pretty sure that the, the athletes developed this this condition but also as the literature says that the probability ratio there is no existent probability ratios for for this test so from a statistical point of view uh, it leaves uh, many many athletes with positive uh, um, with positive dysfunction outside uh, the positivity of this uh, test but i think it's an, it's a nice test in order to to implement in a uh, in an acute phase in order to see and distinguish uh, an, an, aff an affection of the IT band from, from others that we'll see later. The other common test that we'll use is the over test, right? In order to see the stiffness of this part and what we will expect is to see with the knee band in a sideline position, if this uh, hip drops and we'll consider a, a a tight iliotibial band if the the hip one drop the above hip one drop to the to the table um and it's also a myth what the literature says in a study uh, that it was in the previous slide that in uh, cadavers where the there was a transaction of the fascia lata didn't affect this test so it's more influenced by the uh soft tissue properties like the glute mid and glute minimus and also the properties of the hip capsule that will alterate more this uh, this test so i think it's a nice test in order to to implement but don't think about the tightness of the fascia lata when when screening positive uh, in the suspect 
Cinco minutos. ¿Cuántos? Cinco minutos. In this, okay. Uh, there is some differential screening uh, that we have to be aware when when talking about this uh, pathology. But what I think is the most important is to distinguish between ITV pain and the femoral plateau pain because this is the most common when working with uh, with female athletes. Even if you think that in femoral plateau pain, you also see in the lateral part of the patella developing pain, not only in the medial one, but the most important is the the patient history. And maybe I would execute a lateral step down, as you'll see in the next uh, slide, in order to distinguish one. And in the second one, the pain is more associated with the prolonged uh, sitting positions and the cluster of sets that they're so sensible for the femoral patellar pain. And about the Hoffa's pad, the glute meds, tendinopathy, and lateral femoral epicondyl stress fracture, that is a more severe condition, I think uh, it's, it's pretty easy. To, to distinguish from the IT band pain. So here you'll see uh, uh, another pathology that I quite find uh, usually in, uh, in female athletes is the ITV band in uh, so the inflammation in its, uh, in its origin, but the pain is more localized. It's at the TFL insertion, and you can see here uh, how my colleague performs a TFL test and the patient will complain for very localized pain that is quite different from the clinic that the uh, patients with IT band dysfunction present. Let's go fast to the next one. Okay, so what I was talking previously in the image to the left, you see the athlete performing a, a front step down. And what you have to see here is in the, on her right leg, it's that we mostly be the symptomatic one because it's a, when occurring in the, the knee flexion with the hip extension that will, will be more where the, the patient will complain for pain. And the other one to the right will be more characteristic for the femoral pattern of pain for the load that it puts on the anterior aspect of the knee. So this is a fast screening test I usually use in order to, to understand what I'm dealing with. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so what's the the main uh, origin? It's the training error. So the running, we see it more in, uh, in athletes with poor running experience after a big increase in total distance, but also intensity, because you can see to the left where usually uh, athletes will complain for pain is not when increasing suddenly the load. For example, in the week four or five, but in the week six, because when the micro tears and the irritation of this flat pad starts to, to produce is, after, is in the week four or five, but when they start to complain and not being able to tolerate already the, the loads or the normal loads of the training is in the, the week six. Also, it's a question of intensity. It's a study that was did on, on bone tissue. And you see the relationship between the magnitude on the vertical and on the X axis between the cycles needed for the tissue in order to, to, to break, to, to fail. And you can see that after an increase of 10% of intensity, there is a nine-fold decrease of the cycles to failure. So in order for the tissue to fail, it's not about only intensity when you talk about this pathology. Even it was studied in uh, in bones, but also uh, also about uh, intensity. So when the load starts to overcome capacity, it's a question about soft tissue and biomechanics. Where will the uh, pathology manifest? It will be more knee dominant or hip dominant. It's a matter of soft tissue and biomechanics. And here you see the most important risk factors: the functional length, length, and the foot pronation that are not considered risk factor and the hip strength that I'll talk in the next slide and the a positive Albert test are not considered uh, two risk factors in order to develop this uh, pathology. So I believe they, the myth in studying this pathology was that the, um, usually athletes with ITB pain would have would manifest a hip strength deficit and what we've seen through the years that it's not the hip strength deficit, it's not a risk factor for developing the, this pain, but it's more a result. 
So what we have to think is more like uh, as a stra as a reverse engineering. So it's an important uh, pillar to include in our rehab, but it's not a risk uh, factor. So it's more an inhibition uh, because we know every time there is something in the knee occurring at the hip level, we also uh, have a, a decrease in our strength levels. Okay, about the biomechanics in, in, in running, you can see here um, a young football player performing perform a normal run. And, and, and then we analyze usually, uh, honestly, I know not analyzing every time I'm dealing with this, the, uh, the biomechanics uh, of the running because it has pretty much uh, many, pretty many uh, limitation. What we usually think is at a heel strike, right, in, in the running, and this would produce a virus torque on the lateral aspect. But sometimes we, we can see also someone running on their tiptoes and will develop with time uh, this one. So what I, uh, let's go to the next one. What you'll see in this athlete, for example, that we analyzed uh, both, we can analyze both, uh, um, at a quantitative uh, level and measure all these uh, angles that maybe from five cases that I have like this, I do it only in two. I prefer doing it more at a qualitative uh, level and screen for the trunk position at the strong, the pelvic drop that occurs. So uh, screening for a proximal instability at mid stance, the reduced knee window in the red circle, as you see, and the crossover pattern. This one, what will uh, load more than the knee on this actual uh, aspect. And from uh, a sagittal uh, perspective, to see the knee angle uh, at foot strike. Also, at the toe off phase, I'll see the levels of, of hip extension, another four important uh, aspect to see in order to understand the, the, the foot, length, the foot le length or, or stride. And see it for and screen it for over striking and the, the angle of the, the lower leg. Okay, this is the more or less the, the faces with respect, or I would suggest to respect in 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 rehab, so in the dominant pain phase, uh, and uh, other three load phases, but you, as you can see, we already start the, the load uh, in the in the first phase and uh, I'm just calling this in order to understand, to make you understand that this would be a phase where the athlete would test more symptomatic. So what we'll use is uh, we'll implement the the most important variable would be the time under tension and of the isometric exercises and load across the injury. If the athlete that if the athlete has really big pain levels and doesn't tolerate the the low, so the uphill walk would be the main strategy. Also, we would use here. Uh, uh, the BFR, the, the blood flow restriction, maybe the flossing in order to alterate this nociception uh, and to, to make the, the athlete uh, more cooperative from, uh, from uh, a movement perspective. In the second phase, as you'll see in the, in the videos, we'll prescribe the main... Uh, um, the Dos main minutos, uh, variable. Uh, Eugenie. Okay, estamos bien. The, uh, the heavy resistance training will work on walking technique if necessary, and we'll try the athlete to be asymptomatic in the in the plyometric. And we'll start with up kill running, as I mentioned earlier, where the concentric type of load will be superior, still be superior to the eccentric one in order not to uh, overstress the, the tissue. In the third phase, we'll continue with uh, heavy resistance training. We'll implement already unilateral strength exercises and eccentric overload. And from a plyometric point of view, we switch from strength plyometrics to uh, plyometrics implementing the stretch uh, shortening, style, uh, shortening cycle and already prescribe uh, the downhill running. In the Last phase would be the most specific phase, where we will uh, uh, implement already variables that are specific for the football player or if it's a runner. 
and also the most important is the the patient education in all these phases because what you can see that if the pain decreases already from the first phase they want really fast to return to running but if the capacity is really diminished uh, we can't prescribe so fast this uh, uh, this running volumes so as i said usually what we we'll, i would have uh, this uh, as a test in the hip extension so i'll prescribe uh, 60 percent and i'll put them on a first uh, on a first platform and prescribe at the 50 percent uh, of the maximal contraction isometric one 30 seconds uh, isometric series moving to 60 percent and uh, implement before so what you can see is a sequence uh, sim simulating the, the running here, the first easy plan metrics is in a, in a supine position. The weight is is decreased and starting working both of, uh, here at the hip level and ankle level uh, across the joint. And we don't go into a load two phase where we will start challenging this uh, this hip. So here, the main focus is the posterior hip in the, in the second video where the hip contracts eccentrically, the IT vent, sorry, contracts eccentrically in order to uh, decrease the, the the knee flexion and hip extension. And we change the height of the of the trail leg, that's in this case is the right leg, and the intention. In the front leg, driving more through the forefoot, we engage more the quad level and driving more from the, from the heel, obviously with, um, will challenge more the posterior aspect of the hips. And this is an important uh, aspect to, to consider and manipulate the exercise in order to, to avoid big pain levels. I'm not saying pain at all. In a load three phase, in a load three phase, we'll start already implementing both the concentric and eccentric uh, phase of, of jumping so we we still uh, put a big big emphasis on uh, on ground work Sergio or Diego if you can switch this one yeah you can see simulating jumping so both at the concentric level and the center here still working a lot on on the foot and ankle complex with the uh, image to the right and the video to the right already uh, implementing it in a, in a world drill and what here you should see what is the how is the the pelvis moving from a side bend from a side bend here on top to this one challenging all the lateral aspect of the uh, of the hip and preparing the athletes more towards uh, running activities on a load three phase you can see here okay the, the video is pretty pretty small we start already implementing small deceleration so you see the athlete where, where the athlete has a, a forward uh, running changing speeds and challenging the the, the starting to uh, decelerate in, in the end this is what more will stress in this aspect of the of the hip as mentioned before and moving more to a circular motion in the if you can move okay to a more circle mo motion as you see there she moves into the semi curve of the of the area where the outside leg in this ca uh, case would have less demand on this it band and more the the stretch will be put on the inside leg and it will be higher than in a in a linear sprinting or acceleration point of view so when uh, I know that the athlete is able to do the repetitively this kind of, uh, of bouts of, uh, of workout. Uh, we are pretty close to a return to play or return to team training phase. From um, a more specific uh, point of view, in the last phase, what we can also alterate the the loads uh, that the player uh, is exposed to is just by is a very easy one using a metronome or there are so many uh, applications 
uh, the, just by an increase of cadence of the, of the step by 5%, there is a, a decrease in loading of the knee by, by 20%. And this is uh, uh, something we can apply in a, in a specific phase where all, already the athletes, the athletics is exposed to, to many stimuli. But in order to have, as my previously Sergio was, was talking, uh, to have an external uh, focus and uh, and di diminish this this internal focus that some, sometimes the, the athlete may still want to present in uh, and we don't want to in an, an advanced uh, rehab phase. Okay, the, my, I think the the main takeaway messages for this presentation is that uh, as we talk, the ITB. Pain is a, it's a compressive uh, syndrome. Uh, the load management and the patient history are the best elements for, for screening and not the orthopedic test that, that we were given. Uh, the tissue quality and the biomechanics will influence the, the injury site. They're not uh, something that we have to really, really focus on. Uh, they're just parts of the of the of this uh, puzzle, but are not the most uh, most important thing. The load management, I would think, is the main uh, variable that we have to consider because uh, you want to, for example, to train maybe change the the uh, walk or the running pattern. But once the athlete gets to to their specific activity, it's very difficult. To, to maintain the, the same the same style of uh, of running, so I think it's more a, a transitory phase, or you can call it a motor control uh, phase, uh, in order to re restarting to to load this this tissue. And the hip strength uh, is not a risk factor, as we've seen from the studies that the literature has for us, but is one of the main key roles in rehab that uh, we had to to implement. Okay, that's that's everything I had to. Tell you, thank you so much for your attention. Muchísimas gracias por la por la presentación y, y por el detalle, ¿no? El, el aportar los vídeos y por, por describir tan tan de manera exhaustiva todas las fases. Muchísimas gracias, Eugenio. Gracias a vosotros. Vamos a dar paso a la, a la ronda de preguntas. Si alguno de vosotros eh, tiene alguna pregunta, algo que quiera compartir. Fenomenal. Vamos a ver, a pedir el micro. ¿Alguna pregunta? Eh, mi pregunta iba para Sergio, ya teniendo la suerte que estás aquí, que está relacionado con el mundo del básquet. Encima hoy nos has venido a hablar de, de bueno, rotura de ligamento cruzado. Eh, te quería hablar sobre el caso que hay ahora en la NBA del Lonzo Ball. No sé si lo sabes. Eh, se lo rompió en enero de 2022 y bueno, a día de hoy no ha podido volver a jugar y bueno, te quería preguntar, ya van por la tercera vez que lo operan, tú como responsable en la, en la rehabilitación de, dicho, bueno, de dicha lesión, ¿cómo ves que operen tantas veces a un deportista de élite eh, simplemente para que pueda volver a jugar y no tomarse más tiempo en la rehabilitación? Bueno, muchas gracias por tu pregunta. Eh, bueno, a ver, siempre, ah, eh, está aquí, está aquí. Está aquí. Eh, hablar desde fuera siempre es muy arriesgado y al final en, en estos casos es que va a haber 75.000 condicionantes que, que marquen la, la evolución y, y la toma de decisiones, que además normalmente no va a ser una toma de decisiones única y exclusivamente de una persona, sino que al final hay eh, un cuerpo médico, un cuerpo técnico, el propio entorno del jugador, representantes, etcétera, etcétera, que, que van contribuyendo y que influyen al final en, en, en la decisión final. Eh, bueno, es verdad que, que, que es un caso que, que se sale un poco de, de, de la norma o de lo que nos... De lo que, nos podemos encontrar normalmente en, en, en este tipo de lesiones. Eh, pero bueno, al final con, con deportistas profesionales tenemos que entender que, que al final es su, es su vida, ¿no? es, es su manera de desarrollarse, con lo cual ellos van a, a, a intentar hasta la última opción que, que sea posible para, 
para conseguir eh, recuperarse. Es verdad que en el caso no, no te sabría decir exactamente qué tiempos han ido pasando, desde la primera a la segunda lesión, o desde la segunda a la, a la tercera. No sé si se habrán respetado o no los tiempos eh, de recuperación eh, fisiológicos y tisulares eh, en relación a... Entonces, ya te digo, es, es complicado desde, desde, desde fuera el, el poder dar una opinión. For, uh, tissue recovery and so on and so forth. So I can't really give my two cents here, especially because it's obviously a very, very complex case. Thank you. Yo quisiera hacer una pregunta a los, a los dos ponentes. Eh, I have el profesor David Rodríguez en la primera ponencia de la mañana ha comentado que Professor bueno, David Rodríguez in today's first presentation this morning said that in his opinion it would be possible no sé si por to predict injury in the Achilles heel. Do you think that in your particular field, in your particular experience, it is at all possible to predict an ACL injury or um, an IT injury in your case, Eugenio? Uh, Eugenio, you have the floor, if you like. Predicting an IL injury... Yeah, that's not a word I would use so lightly. We can make hypotheses in our day-to-day -day work, for sure, but the best formulas and mathematical criteria we had to predict IT injuries all failed. The ratio between acute load and chronic injuries has been studied a lot. It's still being studied. We still do not have a clear answer. Jury still out. It's, I guess, a little difficult to correlate all the different types of information that we have to juggle in our day-to-day -day practice. It's all very, very complex. Um, the world of sports and the lives of athletes are very, very complex. So we can't predict, I don't think, but I do think we can become aware of when risk factors um, start to accumulate. When they do, we should talk to the rest of our team and do as much prevention work as possible, as much complementary work as possible, with a view to, well, helping our athletes become increasingly uh, robust, increase, increasingly strong, and they can better adapt to the demands of competition. I totally agree with what Eugenie said about what uh, David said and talking about the Achilles heel and uh, I'm going back to the topic I addressed in my presentation. It is true that by looking at the context, the environment, uh, certain minor predictions can be made in the Achilles heel in particular because of simply how it's built and the complications that are likely to occur affecting the Achilles heel, predictions can be made because those injuries are generally related to factors such as load, uh, mechanical factors as well. Whereas in the case of the IT, it's all multifactorial, it's more unpredictable, uh, and it doesn't only relate to the characteristics of the, the the patient, the individual patient. So in, in the case of all of that, it's um, more difficult to make predictions. Thank you very much for uh, answering that questions. Are there any more questions? Anyone else would like to ask a question? Muy bien, pues, eh, very well. Nada más y nada menos, That's eh, damos all por from us. Estas, estas cuartas jornadas, este cuarto encuentro de la de la lesión deportiva.
This uh, fourth edition of uh, our event has finally come to a conclusion. I'd like to thank you for being here with us today. I'd like to thank all the organizers and all the speakers. Um, they've been absolutely great, like uh, every year. So thank you, because without you, this wouldn't be possible. It is a pleasure to work with you. You're impeccable, truly. I'd like to give the floor to Sergio now so that we can officially close today's event. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to thank you all. Really, I'm truly grateful to have had you here. It's very important for us to see how interested you are in all of this, because to us, when we organize an event like this one, and this is something uh, we told all of our speakers, it's something we do because we want to share our experiences, our knowledge. I do hope and look forward to seeing you here, sitting where we're sat right now. It's truly a privilege. It's been a privilege for all of us to be able to talk to you today, to receive your questions. It's a privilege for us, really. So thank you. Thank you for helping us grow. Um, thank you for popularizing topics like this one. I think we can effectively act as a tool in this regard, to spread the knowledge of what, what it is we do. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nilsson. Really, uh, you're absolutely incredible. It's easy to say, but you truly are the best and brightest of events like this one. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. So truly, a big round of applause. Ms. Nelson. I'm saying this truly from the bottom of my heart, because um, I know these events aren't easy to organize and to handle, so thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to the European University. Thank you, Real Madrid. Thank you, Real Madrid University School. Thank you to all those who've made this possible. People working from uh, behind the curtains. Alba, I'd like to thank you, uh, especially because uh, you came here recently and we've already uh, tasked you with such a difficult uh, endeavor. We can promise you, well, this has been your first, it won't be your last, I can promise you that. So, thank you. What you do is very, very important. Because our students are truly capable of incredible things. So it is very, very important uh, that what they do be uh, popularized. Uh, I don't want to forget about Victor, Victor, I know you've also been very, very important. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our families as well, because uh, it takes time to prepare something like this. It's time we're happy to devote to it, but obviously the time we devote to this, we take away from our families, and so they bear with us because they know we do this with love. And if you invest in something, you can't invest in something else. So I'd like to thank our families for being so patient. Thank you to our participants as well for sharing your time with us. I truly appreciate this. That's all. Everything you need, make sure uh, you reach out to us. You can use social media. If you like, we'll be happy 
Así uh, que, que no se quede so aquí, que sobre todo desde la mesa de... Talk to you about anything you need. Sigamos invirtiendo, fijaros con qué fuerza vamos. We will keep on investing y in uh, end of year um, dissertations and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you who are following us remotely as well. We don't want this to end here. This has important repercussions on society. We're here to serve athletes and sports people, so a million thanks, everyone, and congrats for making this possible. Thank you.